board. It's 9.30. Today's Thursday, April 16th. Uh, my name is Brian Zomalt. I'm the director of the county's Office of Technology and Innovation. I will be playing the role of technology moderator for today's virtual meeting. Uh, on the panel with me is Don Crowell from the county attorney's office, who will be serving as process moderator. Uh, before we start the meeting, I'd like to do a quick roll call and ensure that we have adequate communications for each commissioner. Uh, if you would, if you would, please unmute yourself and uh, let me know that you're present. Uh, we'll start with Commissioner Eggers. Here. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Seal. Here. Commissioner Welsh. Here. Commissioner Long. Here. Commissioner Justice. Here. Commissioner Peters. I'm here. And last but not least, Commissioner Gerard. Here. All right, Madam Chair, it appears we have a quorum. I'll now turn the meeting over to you. Okay, well, the first item on our agenda is uh, to extend the local state of emergency. Barry, do you wanna talk about that? Good morning, commissioners. So the first item on the agenda is to adopt a resolution. Uh, this would order the extension of the uh, local state of emergency. Uh, that would extend the, uh, this until Friday. Uh, April the 24th. I do have a short presentation to kind of outline where we've been and where we're at today. Uh, so Brian. Great. I'll leave it so, on and I'll do it over here instead of here. It's picking up the glare from the window. Um, so um, Brian, if you go to the first slide, please. So just to highlight um, kind of where we've been, um, it, as you can see on this line, it's kind of a timeline of actions. We began this on March the 20th, uh, where the commissioners ordered the public beaches, public parking areas close. Obviously that was a, as a result of uh, what we saw uh, on the beaches and the crowds. Um, that, if you look back though, and you can see from the timeline with the number of cases, we had a few cases at that time, but we knew it was going to get worse. Well, in fact, from this timeline, you can also see that in fact it did. On March the 26th, we come back and ask that we issue a state safer at home order that provided a, a ban on public and private assemblies uh, and the and included closing pools and all public playgrounds. Since March of 26, um, as you can see, the number of cases has steadily climbed. Um, and on April the 3rd, the governor issued the executive order, which addressed all and it, it defined all essential businesses. Um, and therefore, you cannot leave your home except to go to what is defined as an essential businesses per the governor's order. Next slide. So where we're at today, and I wanted to give you a little perspective, just a little over a week period. We've talked a lot about flattening the curve. Flattening the curve is really to where we, because as we know, with coronavirus, there is no cure. Um, and we're talking about, and we've seen stories about systems where the hospital system, the emergency medical system has been overwhelmed. They could not provide for the safe treatment of patients uh, with either PPE, hospital beds, or uh, ventilators. Well, and just a week ago on the 7th, um, and these models, you can find a lot of different models, but we just took a snapshot and we said, some the projections as best that we could see, you could see that a week ago um, on the 7th, there was a projection that at that peak, and that peak being the middle of, of April, that we in fact would exceed our um, intensive care unit beds. We were doing okay in terms of those projections with hospitalizations. Um, and in fact, the safer at home order has worked. People have heeded the warning and we have slowly seen a steady, uh, a slowing of that significantly increased curve. The best projections today though, are very different from just a week ago. And as you can see on the bottom, that same ICU bed is projected the peak not to be until early May and it would, would be within the available resources of our emergency medical, uh, of our hospital uh, system. So we've been watching these cur this curve, we've been watching the models and working with our hospital system 
and our emergency responders to make sure, in fact, that they're properly um, supported with uh, adequate equipment, but watching to see what we are facing at that peak period, which has been changing every day. Um, and that's a result of people's, direct result of people's actions and trying to prepare for that, that worst point. Go to the next slide. So today, what we're looking at is uh, we, well, this was as of yesterday, that we have 502 cases. Um, we have had 14 deaths, um, but the, that projected peak uh, will, won't occur until April the 26th. Now we have been slowing in the amount, as you can see on the bottom right, um, the amount of new cases per day. Um, but even yesterday, we see the, the, yesterday the increase was three, today we've seen we saw that increase be 13 cases. Um, that's going to change daily because we're also at a point where you know people are are looking at alternative means for testing, and I have that on our next slide. But you can see the steady climb. You know, again, just back you know on March 23rd, you know we were very low inside of um, you know less than a month. We've significantly seen that uh, that case flow, and it has not. Um, we have not hit that peak yet. That wouldn't be until April the 23rd. But an, another point, where we're at today, if in fact these graphs are correct, we wouldn't be back to the point where we're at today till late May or even possibly June. And so I just put that in perspective in terms of where we're at and the, the time frame it will be for us to get back to um, even, uh, the point where we're at today, going through this peak period and kind of seeing that steady decline. But again, that's a, that's a projection. We hope it's quicker. We're, gonna, we're watching it every day and we're using the best information available to try and make that, um, uh, try to make those predictions. Go to the next slide. To put that in perspective, you know, in, in uh, Florida, we've, um, or I'm sorry, in, in Pinellas County, we've tested approximately 9,400 individuals. So that's, 1% of our population. Um, in Florida, they've um, tested more than 200,000 individuals. So that's one for every 140 people. So the so they're beginning to ramp up the testing capabilities. They're beginning to ramp up uh, private labs that can turn tr have turnaround times a lot quicker. Um, that was a, a significant deficiency um, up until we're seeing that beginning to get you know, caught up. But again, we're still at that point where we've only tested approximately 1% of our population. Um, go to the next slide. So one of the things that you've asked, you know, for some time is how do we come out of this? How do we know when we can make decisions to uh, ease up on some of the restrictions? Well, part a, a big part of that is going to be based upon state policies. Um, and we've seen models coming out of other states where they're looking at developing ways to reopen the economy. Um, we know the impact this is having, especially on our small businesses um, and on uh, individuals and families. So we need a comprehensive strategy. The local strategy should fit and mirror with the state strategy. Um, and so that the governor's order goes through the end of the month. Hopefully we'll have more guidance in terms of how they intend to reopen the economy, and we can tailor our local strategies with that state and, and even maybe national strategy. Um, but the indications, and, and we've seen this play out and how others are looking at that, that we would like to see what, what is that point where we can consider other options. We'd like to see a sustained reduction in cases for at least 14 consecutive days. Why is that? That's the incubation period. And, and so, again, if we look at the time periods that we've discussed in previous slides, we want to see that going down. Right now, it's going up. It's still going up. Um, and so we, we hope that that peak period is sooner. Um, again, we'll, we'll make some of these decisions, I hope, based upon the conditions on the ground. And we'll continue you know, these dialogues and provide the best information available. We also want to make sure that we have the uh, capacity to test everyone that needs a test. And so that is something that, again, is ramping up. We think that they're going to be there and that those resources will be available. But that, and then that we also want to make sure that our hospital and our uh, fire and EMS personnel are properly uh, equipped to treat um, all patients requiring hospitalization 
without resorting to any type of crisis measures. Every indication that we're seeing through uh, the projections uh, would uh, lead us to think, believe that is true and that, we'll, and that we are prepared. Um, but again, each day has changed and we want the conditions on the ground to, to drive um, that decision-making process. Next slide, please. So what are the steps before easing restrictions? First, we believe that the governor's order needs to be revoked or modified. Um, and that's something that we hope will play out over the next you know, two weeks. Uh, our local resolution, if you recall back, when we first acted was to issue a, a safer at home policy. A safer at home policy asks that people and businesses implement social distancing practices. So another way of addressing that would be to, to ease back on these restrictions, allow people to open, but do it in a safe manner. Um, but again, we need to see how the governor modifies his order for that to occur. Again, he defined the essential versus non-essential business. Um, we would like to see the uh, confirm um, cases and the testing and the hospital capacity that that is being met, as I said on the previous slide. Um, while this is occurring, we'd like to develop strategies to address our pools and our public beaches. Um, we have both condo pools, we have uh, community pools, we have uh, hotel pools, um, and you know each one has um, there's a specific need, but we need to be able to manage that. You know there are thousands of pools, and so in fact the we need to be able to the sheriff needs to be able to respond to any concerns. To be able to implement safe distancing practices. I know the need. I understand that there are many condo complexes where um, you have a few people going out there using it for exercise. We also have pictures and real life examples of condo complexes uh, where it, it the pool decks were full and people were not implementing safe distancing practices. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, applying a uniform um, manner helped us to mock to. Um, um, tamp down the curve and, and, and get a handle on what was a public health crisis. The same thing goes for beaches. Beaches are a little more particular because it can, they can attract a lot of people back um, to the hotels, to um, driving over and parking, even if we close par parking areas into neighborhoods and other things. So we need to work with our municipalities uh, re regarding how, in fact, we would open public beaches. Um, and, and I think that that input from them and working with our law enforcement uh, personnel to have a comprehensive strategy in anticipation of a relaxation of those orders at some point in the future would be important to have a, stra a strategy that we would feel comfortable presenting to you. So those two areas need to be refined further. Um, we have a bit of time, we believe, at staff um, before we're ready for that. And so um, the, the one thing to remember is all of these indicators are should be based upon the conditions on the ground to what is actually occurring and if in fact we ease restrictions and we see a, re, a reoccurrence of increased cases that we need to be prepared but be able to modify our orders to where we can contain um, the virus and not have community spread. So that is a very brief um, overview of kind of where we're at the issues that we have facing us and how we would recommend proceeding with this, uh, um, with our uh, emergency order. Now, I would also ask, um, and we've had a big question regarding um, the uh, essential businesses. And again, that was defined by the governor's order. I would ask our county attorney to uh, address that in terms of the response and how we've, you know, referred people to, uh, to the governor's order and some of the inconsistencies. Yeah, building on what the county administrator is, uh, you know, just presented to the group, we have been to the extent that we've been getting inquiries, uh, like you said, referring folks to the governor's office in the executive order that we're traveling under now, primarily from the governor, the, the stay at home order, there is a process set forth in that order for folks to contact uh, the term is the state coordinating officer, and that individual has the ability to add to the list of essential uh, businesses or services. Here at the county level, we do not. 
Um, as you all know, there was a bit of a debate when the governor's order first went into effect. There was very immediately a subsequent order issued uh, that seemed to take away the authority of counties to do anything to the contrary. My opinion is it didn't take it away. It just restricted us to the point that we could be more strict than the state's order, but not less strict. So in other words, in my opinion, we cannot deem something essential that the governor has not deemed essential. So we have been providing uh, folks that contact us to the extent that we can get that information out, uh, the information on what is set forth in that order and the means by which uh, they may seek relief with the state. And I know that there has been much contact, uh, much discussion actually about some of the businesses out there. And I know that you all have received a great deal of contact uh, about some businesses in particular um, that would like to be deemed essential. And again, here at the county level, we don't have the authority to stray from the governor's order. Uh, one thing in particular I will mention, and I have um, you know, informed each of the commissioners of this, is that we actually had our first lawsuit uh, served on the county yesterday uh, regarding um, a COVID related matter. And that was a lawsuit filed by a local business uh, seeking an injunction from a judge to uh, basically allow their business to reopen. Um, Woody's Wash Shack is the name of the business. Ironically, they never once called themselves a car wash in the lawsuit. Uh, rather, they referred to themselves as a sanitation business. And I mentioned that to bring forward the fact that you know, the sheriff has to send his deputies out there and his staff to try to enforce this order. And, and I don't want to speak for the sheriff, but I don't really think it's fair for him to try to give direction to each of those deputies out there to perform an analysis as to whether somebody is washing a car or sanitizing a car or, you know, perhaps doing something else. I know that we have taken the perspective, if the business is not on the list of essential businesses, it's not essential and it needs to be closed. Um, and again, we don't have the authority to designate something essential that is not deemed essential by the state. And they have set forth a process for doing that. I would also add that, you know, we understand there's inconsistencies and in, through, throughout different counties. Um, there, that we are not the only county that have, have, has taken the position uh, we have on certain areas. Um, however, we have also submitted a list uh, to the governor's office um, asking for clarification regarding particular things within his order. And again, we have not received a response to that. Mr. Eggers, you had. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, that was that was the question I was gonna ask is, is how are we dealing uh, with these different questions that come in? I know we're funneling them to you all. Um, and, and then in turn, we're making local decisions or are those first, those, those requests first going up to the state to get their input? Um, in the meantime, we're considering them a non-essential, uh, but we've sent them up to the state for input. Or are we making the decisions local? I think some of the confusion with people is, is that there is such differences in counties on some of these areas, not on all areas, just several of them. And so just having a, trying to have a better understanding as to how the process works. And then at the end of it, how we may make maybe a slightly different judgment, I think would be helpful for some of these businesses to understand. Well, the sheriff and I, um, as this began to unfold, we met, we talked through each one of these individual situations, and we had to make a decision. Um, and we made that decision. And so uh, we're trying our best to interpret the governor's order and implement it. Um, we There is plenty of room for um, clarification within the governor's order, um, as you're well aware, as we previously spoke about in our meeting. Um, but again, we had to make a decision. We did so. Um, and but we also left open that the governor could further clarify his order, which he did with um, pro wrestling um, and um, and said that that was deemed an essential business. So if he would do that, that would be fine. We're trying to implement it as we see fit um, in terms of how we interpret the order. Um, and so I'm, I, I apologize for uh, differences amongst uh, counties, but we uh, were left with implementing a very broad order and we did the best we could with it. And, and I don't think we can continue to debate over and over again, um, you know, whether something is deemed essential or not. We did the best we could with it, and we're implementing it as we read it. Yeah, I think that's imp that's important to understand. I just want to make sure, frame that because it's some a lot of this isn't on us. Some of it is, and I just you know again we have to keep reminding folks that uh, 
that there is a little room for judgment and you all are, as you say, doing the best you can. Um, but thank you for that uh, uh, somewhat clarification. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've got three, three questions. And the first one, um, I just want to agree with Barry that the way this was implemented statewide does leave room for interpretation by the counties. You know, I mean, that's kind of built into the way they roll the order out. And so I know it's just very difficult when you hear one county is allowing a service and we're not. I think that's just a product of the way the, the order was rolled out statewide. Um, my first question is, when does the governor's order expire? Uh, the second question is, where are we on testing and is there any rapid testing in Pinellas County? And I didn't, I didn't know if Dr. Cho was going to be on our call or not. What Dr. Uh, let, keep going. I, the last question is, you know, I, I know all of our hearts just sink when we talk to these businesses that are, you know, they're saying they're a couple of weeks out and this is their life's work. And, and it's so tough to say, no, we can't allow you to open back up because this is the state's essential list rule. But where are we in terms of planning our you know, connecting these businesses with real resources, because a lot of what we're hearing is that the resources that are supposed to be out there, the websites aren't working, they can't get through the application process, and they're not getting the help they need. So where are we in helping them connect to real resources? And then where are you, Barry, on your plan for Pinellas County's effort to help those businesses for the restart and the rebuild? Okay, so first, um, the governor's order was extended until April the 30th. Um, so that, that's the first piece. The second piece um, with, in terms of the businesses, there are thousands of businesses that are impacted. You're dealing, you're hearing from a few, um, but you know, there are um, a lot of small businesses and restaurants and everybody else that's in the same exact position. Um, and, and Remember, if you recall a few weeks ago, our safer at home order and where we wanted to go was to keep small business open by implementing social distancing practices. That is my preference. I know that's a sheriff's preference and, and I wanna be back there. We are trying to implement a governor's order and if, if we have literally hundreds upon hundreds of requests um, that we had to make a decision on and different angles that people are going after under this and we certainly understand that. Um, I'd be doing the same thing if I was trying to, you know, uh, keep people employed, keep my business. I do understand it. Um, but we had to make a decision regarding the order that was given. Uh, we had to interpret, we had to implement it. In terms of assistance to business, a um, couple of things, one, um, and to individuals. I mean, you know, we know the state's unemployment um, has had challenges. Uh, we're trying, again, to, you know, connect people, but we can't put them in through that system. Um, through small business, our small business um Development Center um, has links to resources and assistance for small businesses to try to link them and help them navigate the state systems uh, that would link them up to resources. The second item on the agenda, however, is going to be discussing direct assistance to our businesses and to our families um, that we have been working on uh, as a program that will be implemented by um, Pinellas County. And so we, we want to link people with the state resources, with federal resources, and we also um, want to try to help them directly. So it'll be a combination of both of those. But I encourage anybody that needs assistance, um, one, to call 211. They can link families. If you're a business, call our small business, uh, our economic development department. It's on our website. It all talks about the uh, assistance programs that are available, and our staff will help you to navigate those programs and, and connect you with those resources. We can't do that for you, but we can help you in trying to get the resources, the state or federal resources that are available. Chair Gerard, may I say something? Yes, please. Uh, Commissioner Welch, um, you know, the CARES Act has a lot of different pots of money to it um, with different rules for each pot of money. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the big pots of money that will be funneled through the county um, is, is this direct assistance to business. This is different than that, the program that went through the banks where I'm sure you've heard people have maxed out on that because they have maxed out on that apparently from what I've read. Um, but these, these new pots of money, which are part of the CARES Act and um, Pinellas County uh, is, um, has an allocated sum on that 
is to is to benefit um, businesses um, which have been hurt by by the coronavirus and their business impacted. This federal legislation was passed so quickly. Um, you know, it doesn't go through the usual careful process. And, and trying to get the rules involved with this and who qualifies and how is it going to be dispersed. And there's also a big push by the federal government to disperse this money in a real quick manner. As a matter of fact, one of the reports, which I'm sure Barry's going to be talking about, I know it's part of the agenda, is something where we have to give our initial um, indication tomorrow um, with a report saying, yes, we qualify for these funds and they will um, come to Pinellas County. But that's just a an indicator to put us on the chart to make sure that we're uh, qualifying for those funds. I'm sure Barry's going to talk about this more later, I, but there's, I a, am. there's a good amount of money there for, for local businesses that, that the county will, will be helpful in. Thank you, Ken. Thanks. Madam Chair, the last question was on the testing. Mm -hmm. Oh, the testing. Is Dr. Cho on the line? Yes. Yeah. So, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so in terms of the testing, we do speak to the hospitals on a pretty regular basis. Uh, I think what they've done over the last uh, few weeks have been amazing. They've been able to increase testing capabilities. I think the rapid test you're probably referring to, uh, Commissioner, is, is that AVID 15 minute test. I know, uh, I believe Baycare has that test and I, I know other hospital systems are working to develop a, a similar um, rapid test. So whether it's uh, uh, the AVID test uh, among, or others. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Long, did you have something? Chair, I sure did. And uh, weighing in on this discussion that's been going on between Commissioner Welch and, and our clerk, uh, I am very aware that those federal dollars have been sent out. The problem is they are stuck in processing. And when you try to run that down and figure out where the glitch is, the Small Business Administration is telling people that it's in review, that they've been approved, but it's in review. Well, I don't know what that means, quite frankly, because the idea was to get the money in the hands of those people that can continue paying their employees and keeping their business open. So that's my first concern. My second concern, while Barry touched on it just ever so briefly, is I'd like to know if the rest of my colleagues are receiving phone calls and messages from our folks that have lost their job, who have now been unemployed for a month, who have tried to file for unemployment, but cannot get through the application process because you get so far into it and then the whole damn system just throws you out and makes you start all over again. Yesterday, I was on the phone for more than half the day talking to our state legislators to ask and plead with them, can they please get this system fixed? If ever there was a time when it needs to work, it needs to work. And, you know, while I certainly don't want to cast dispersions on anyone, I know that our governor inherited this terrible product, but come on, there has to be some way to provide these people some level of assistance when they can't pay their rent and they have no money to buy food. What are they supposed to do? If we think we've got a crisis right now, these people are desperate and desperate people do desperate things. So we've got to put some kind of plan in place to help these people and what can we do as a county government to help get the state to get off their dime? Well, I think we're going to talk about that in the next issue. Um, Commissioner Long, I know the Career Source has some ability to help people fill out the paper applications and get them submitted since the website is not working very well or at Thank all. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, the question I had was goes back to that essential business issue. We've, I think we've all talked with a lot of local businesses that are trying to figure out the rules of the road here. And uh, we, we've heard, I've heard from uh, companies that support the golf industry because it, golf is essential they help support that with repair, but they're not essential. 
Um, I've heard acupuncturists who think they're under health, but different rules for telehealth. I just want to be clear about the process that they call us and then we've been sitting it upstairs, but it's not really our decision. It's the state's decision. So I guess I, if we're not deciding, we should be funneling that straight to whatever division in Tallahassee that is going to make the decision whether to add that specific industry to the essential list, like the governor's done with a few others. The article I read the other day, so the governor said he hadn't actually got that many calls about being added to essentials yet. That's exactly what our email is flooded with, whether it's uh, dog groomers or golf support or anything else, car washes. Um, I just wanna be clear about the process and who holds the actual authority. And, and what I hear this morning is that, that the governor and the state emergency hold that authority, but it keeps coming to us. So I just wanna be clear about the process and do we have a name and an email and a phone number to refer folks to so that they can go straight to the person that will actually be making the decision? Commissioner Peters, did you have something? Did you want to have someone respond to my question or? Uh, yeah. Nah. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Burton, do you have? Well, the, uh, the, it is a state coordinating officer as the way it is defined. I do not have a specific number. Um, I, I, while we're talking, I will have staff, you know, look that up and that way I can um, put that out. Um, but um, I, I don't know who the state coordinating officer is. We contacted the governor's office directly with a list of clarification issues. Uh, which, you know, includes car washes, which includes dog groomers and some of those others that we've said, and, you know, we've, and we've offered any type of assistance to provide better clarification on some of the issues that everybody's struggling with interpreting how to implement this order. Um, again, we have not received a response um, to our request, uh, but we did make it. And if I could add to what the, uh, the administrator's remarks, um, there is another executive order that defines the state coordinating officer is essentially the director of the environment uh, direct the Department of Environment, uh, sorry, of emergency management at the state. Um, we can try to track down that information. I don't know how successful anybody has been um, in appealing to the state with any of these issues. Um, I think that one point of confusion that may be out at large in the public is I know that many of the requests that I have seen come in are business st businesses stating, but we can comply with the CDC guidelines. We can yes. um, social distance, you know, between employees, between patrons, between patrons and employees. And that is simply not what the governor's order says. Okay. Your original order that was enacted here at the, in Pinellas County prior to the state's order took what we felt were very reasonable uh, measures and said, we are asking businesses to implement CDC guidelines. So in other words, no groups more than 10, implement social distancing, the state's order does not take that tactic. The state's order simply lists businesses that are deemed essential. So regardless of whether or not you can implement social distancing, if you or other CDC guidelines, if you're not on the list, you're not essential. All right. Yes, Commissioner Peters. So, um, I, you know, Barry, I appreciate the work that you've done and I really appreciate the work that Dr. Cho and the Sheriff have done. Um, I brought up on Monday that I would like to see us relax on the pools and I know you touched on it. Um, you know, you said that there's been a, a, an increase suddenly and I know this morning there was a little uptick, but I'm looking at 14 days of declining and almost flattening out. Um, and I really do believe, as I said on Monday, that citizens should be able to use their pools. Um, I certainly can use my pool because I live in a single family resident, but the people down the street in the condominium cannot. Many of our condominiums are snowbirds. Many of them are half empty. They're not doing vacation rentals. So you may have a condo unit with 10 units, but only four people are living there because the other people aren't there right now. Um, and yet those four individuals can't use their pool um, what I've seen out in the community is that people are being safe. People are keeping their distance. They're being very responsible. And I do believe that people can be responsible by going down to a pool. And if somebody else is down there, they can wait till somebody else isn't down there. Um, I, I do believe it's, it's important to many of the people that live in our condos, particularly senior citizens, that they have the opportunity to recreate and as many options as they can 
Now, if they are a risk, if they are a high risk, then of course, as they're doing now, they would also do the same when it came to going to their pools. You've got many people that are at high risk that are going to the, you know, the grocery store and they're using an elevator. We haven't closed down elevators. Um, you know, I, I understand the sheriff doesn't feel he's ready to open up the beaches at, at even an incremental level. You know, um, I understand that. I respect that. If he feels he's not ready to enforce that, I, I would agree with him on that. Um, but I think on pools, I, I think we kind of picked winners and losers and single family homeowners can have a pool and yet somebody in an apartment building or a condo building cannot be in a pool. Um, I'd really like to hear, you know, what the sheriff says on enforcement on that. But based on what I've seen out in the community, people are being responsible. And I think we can trust the citizens of Pinellas County to stay safe and be safe because nobody wants to be sick. There's nobody out here that wants to get sick, right. that wants to be at risk of death. And, and I trust our citizens that they're going to do the right thing. And I think it's time we let them have another opportunity for recreation and use the pools that are on their private property. Um, and so I'd like a conversation about that, please. Yes, uh, Commissioner, <laughs> Mr. Burton. Okay, so uh, just a couple of clarifications and I would like the sheriff to weigh in regarding the pools and the enforcement and what they saw because we absolutely understand that there are differences among small condos and larger condos and things like that, um, but there is an enforceability. But let me just clarify one, one point. Um, we have not seen a decline at locally in our case numbers. They are, you're exactly right, they're going up. We were very excited yesterday when we saw an increase of three or five or something like that. It was very small. Um, today it's up 13. Is that leveling off? I certainly hope so. I certainly hope that peak is not April the 26th. Originally, just a few days ago, it was April the 21st um, under the models. These models, you know, can be wrong. I mean, and so we're watching that literally every day. And I hope that peak is tomorrow and we see a steady decline but we haven't seen that decline here locally. And so we, I think my only caution is that we do um, make these decisions based upon what we actually see here locally um, to where we know we're coming out of this. There's a 14 day incubation period. That's the reason we chose 14 days is that we're seeing a decline in the cases, a decline in the numbers and the people that have been positive and, that, and we're seeing that decline have been through that incubation period. Um, those are some of the guidelines that we're seeing out of our health um, experts, and that's the reason we we kind of picked that as a as a tool for us in that decision making. So, um, because the numbers have gone down, you know, at the state level, um, but again, we we just need to apply that locally as we as we um, go into this a little bit further. And and I certainly hope that that model's wrong, and I I hope it's tomorrow. I really do. But I'd like to for the sheriff to comment in, in regarding the enforceability and the issue on the pool. Well, just just before you go to that, uh, Barry, you know, I didn't you didn't put the presentation that you sent in Granica, so I can't go back to the page I want to refer to. But if you go to the DOH website, March 30th was our, our highest number of new cases. And and ever since March 30th, our numbers of new cases have gone down and they seem to have put a kind of flat line that jumps a little. And I don't believe we're ever going to have no new cases. Um, and, and again, I, what I'm talking about here, and I'm, I understand your position, and I guess you and I are disagreeing on the graphs that we're looking at, because the graph that I'm looking at, it peaked at March 30th and, and significantly declines on, on new numbers um, every single day. Um, and even the new numbers from yesterday are significantly lower than the numbers were three days ago. So, well, um, that's in the number of new cases. They not, the total number of cases has not gone down. It has increased and it continues to increase. Well, then that may be a sidebar, but you'll have to explain to me when we look at total, total cases, right? Um, so we have total cases right now, 473. I'm not I'm sure not that because you're going to count the case that happened March 15th. That never comes out of that case. So you know, maybe I don't understand how you're looking at those numbers. I'm looking at total new cases. Total new cases are, you know, what I think is, you know, evidently we're looking at different numbers. And I look at the state number on their new cases, and again, they're going down statewide. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure I understand what numbers you think we should have, because if it's going to be total cases in the county, the total cases are never going to go down. Only oh, yeah, the total will. new cases are going to go down. Why don't we let Dr. Cho um, 
because he's our health expert and looking at these models and um, and ask him to comment on that. So with the modeling, it's tricky. I think there's a number of models out there and I'm, we're trying to create something locally. Um, uh, and I, I just looked while we were uh, talking here, uh, the model that's most uh, recently uh, cited, um, I mean, the most uh, commonly cited, the one from the University of Washington, what they call the IHME model, they just changed their peak again because this shifts as new variables come into place. And they're now peaking us back at M May 3rd in terms of the cases. Uh, to some degree, that's a function of what we're doing with the social distancing, if you think about it. So uh, as we're flattening the curve the, the, and you flatten that uh, bell curve, the, the peak is actually uh, shifting over. So uh, that is, that is uh, something that uh, we're monitoring and something that um, uh, we need to continue to monitor. Uh, beyond this, uh, we need to also look at some of the epi curves on a regional level, something that we're working with the data group on. Because uh, it wouldn't matter as much if, for example, we were going down and Hillsborough was going up. Uh, we want the whole region as a whole uh, to follow mirror the same curves. And for the most part, uh, it looks like it. And I like to think we're, we're, we're plateauing, but the modeling and the, what the experts are saying, we still have a, a, a week or two before we actually do see the, the peak, both in Florida and here in the Tampa Bay area. Sheriff, do you want to address this issue? Sure. Um, first, let me just go back to uh, Commissioner Justice's question as far as getting any additional guidance from the state. You know, we've tried, and what we've been told is, is that you got what you got. So I don't think it's realistic that we're going to get anything else, and um, we are making these decisions. You know, ultimately, I guess you, you ask, you know, who's ultimately responsible? I guess it's me, because it, from an enforcement standpoint, that's where the decision has to be made, and, and I work closely with the administrator and know that we are uh, vetting all of these questions and where we can. Uh, we are working with people. I've gone out myself, uh, personally, to a, a number of locations assessment and made decisions. So there's a lot of diligence and due diligence going into the decision-making process. But from everything that I've been told, everything I've seen, uh, everything I know is that it has to be at our level to hear at a local level uh, and the state isn't going to do anything more. So um, just fill that in for you is, is that uh, we've tried, but that's what they've said is, is that they're not making any adjustments. You got what you got, work with it. So that's what we're doing. Uh, as far as the uh, pool issues are concerned, there are almost thousand pools in Pinellas County. Uh, and one of the things I can tell you for sure is, is that any decision that's made has to be all or nothing. It is impossible. And we've seen this throughout this event uh, to do things on an incremental basis. It creates uh, an enforcement nightmare. Uh, and it, it also creates uh, a lot of probably reality, but certainly perception of unfairness is you can't say that, uh, okay, we're just gonna open the condo pools and the HOA pools, but we're not gonna open the hotel pools, we're not gonna open the country club pools, we're not gonna open this pool or that pool. And it creates a have and have not situation. And you know, I'd also say that uh, having uh, people in the pools where we've seen it is, is that, uh, yeah, some people use it for exercise, sure. sure. But also, you know, people consider exercise uh, chugging a Budweiser and, and partying in the pools, and those kinds of things. And it really, it has to be an all or a nothing. And to, to think that, you know, you can put caveats on it or certain restrictions on it, I can tell you, is that it, it, it just like all the things that we're battling uh, with the businesses, is, is that the majority, the absolute majority, uh, are trying the best they can and are compliant. But there's still a lot of challenges out there, and there's a whole lot that are trying to put a round ball in a square hole, that are manipulating it, trying to twist it, trying to do these things. And, you know, I, I use this in a discussion the other day when we all had, and I'll say it again, is, is that, you know, when you decide to get down this path, you follow it through. And, you know, you don't, uh, when you take that prescription of penicillin, you don't stop halfway through the prescription. You follow it through to the end. And we're two weeks away now, two weeks tomorrow from when the governor's order expires. Uh, that's a point, I believe, for all of us uh, in the decision that the governor makes, whether to extend it, amend it, uh, let it lapse, and then it would kick it back to the counties uh, to decide. But we don't know what the governor is going to do. And trying to make decisions now, uh, and I agree uh, that the counts are still going up from all the data that I've seen. We are not at the peak by any of the models. And uh, I, I think that as far as the pools are concerned, is, is that it has to be an all or nothing. You, you cannot uh, say we're only going to open up these certain pools uh, or only for this purpose or for this reason. Uh, there's no way that we can adequately uh, implement that or enforce it. 
Anybody else? Okay, we have, um, yes, Mr. Right. Peters. So um, I share if I, I respect everything that you said and I, I value that and I understand how difficult this is. Um, and just like somebody sitting in their pool in their backyard might open up a Budweiser, I understand how that could happen in a, in a condominium. I, I understand that. Um, we've said that we wanna wait until the governor's rule and I agree with that. I'm not saying we should do anything that the governor's order doesn't say. Um, the pools is something the county did um, more restrictive. Um, and I really would like to see the county open up the pools. Now, I'm certainly willing to make a motion to change that in our executive emergency order. I don't know that I would get a second, but I, I really think that people should have the right to be on their private property and use their swimming pools with smart regard, with you know health and safety in mind. Um, but I certainly would entertain that. You know, maybe you all consider that. And if there's no second, that's fine. And I'll end the conversation. Commissioner Walsh. I have a, a question. Uh, and I, you know, when we're talking about this data, I think we always have to remember that, that it's imperfect at best. We are not testing enough to even know, you know, how much of the virus is out there. And so it comes back to testing, testing, testing. We've tested 1% of, of our population. We really don't know. Um, my question is, there was a, an article and, and staff sent us some information about 28 people at a Seminole facility um, that were um, had to be sent out to different facilities yesterday. Are those new cases or are, was that 28 already in the reported hospitalizations that we had? Ask Dr. Choda to um, comment on that. So uh, what the state does, and it was included for the most part in, in, um, in the daily update and the case counts, uh, they do separate the cases based on the long-term care facility. Um, as of this morning, we are up to 60, 60 in various sites. Um, and um, I think I've, I've mentioned here some of the process and how we work with the, um, the long-term care facilities. Once we have a case, uh, we work with them, do a, a joint inspection with ACA uh, to look at any deficiencies, staffing issues, uh, infection control practices. Uh, from there, we do a monitor and, and a test when uh, other residents are, are symptomatic. Um, we uh, are in communications with them on a constant basis. And if the need arises and uh, they need more resources, need additional assist assistance in terms of supplies, um, we uh, do help facilitate that and we do serve as a subject matter expert and consultation uh, consultation on uh, some infection control practices. Uh, so, so that those 30 were already in our our number of 500 plus? Yes, yes. They're, they're included uh, in the total case count, but they also separate uh, of the 500, um, 513 cases of those cases are either staff or resident in the long-term care facilities. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Long. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would just like to remind everyone that <clears throat> we have historically always taken our actions and our votes based on the data that we have received from administration. And I, I would like to go on record that I think every single one of us are very sensitive to the needs of our citizens. You all remember when uh, a while ago there was a comment made that the state knows better how to take care of our citizens than we do. But the fact of the matter is we are leaders in our community and we are responsible for life and public health and safety in Pinellas County. And I do not intend to vote for any motion or anything that is not supported by facts and by data and by the science that Dr. Chow has been provided. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Eggers. Um, well, um, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Commissioner Long if she was looking at my notes. Um, that's kind of where I was <laughs> no, going. No, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing, but, but I, I'm just you supposed I, to be sitting right beside me and I don't know where you are right now. Yeah, you're, you're not there. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I think we have we have we have asked since the beginning to develop uh, metrics to develop numbers. And I think a lot of people asked us going into this, how are the numbers guiding you 
into this pandemic. And I would argue that probably not nearly as much as what's the, how they're going to guide us out of the pandemic. And, and I would suggest that probably within a couple, three, four weeks, it's going to be back in our laps um, to make uh, other um, unwinding decisions or where we start la uh, you know, uh, lowering the restrictions or lessening the restrictions. And uh, we have got to have a methodology about doing it. I mean, again, there's a lot of qualitative things we're talking about. We're talking about enforcement and we're talking about, you know, different uh, qualitative issues. But these numbers are so incredibly important. And I do think there's a fairness issue on the pools. I don't know where you draw the line on the pools. Um, and, you know, I've gotten a lot of emails from people that are in, in the pools or part of us condo associations. And they're saying, please don't open them because, you know, there's always about 10% of the folks that just don't do what we ask them or what the, the association that they're a part of asked them to do. It's just, there's an inconsistency there. And I think, you know, there's an enforcement issue. And I think there, you know, the fairness issue that was brought up, I would be interested in hearing Dr. Cho and the, and the, and the team as time goes on that, that flattening the curve, which I think we've had some success, but how that extends you know, it does extend that, uh, that, 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 that maximum date. I guess now that you said it's uh, April, well, it, excuse me, it's in May now. So I think that's going to be important uh, to understand a little bit more. But I do think these numbers and, and, and looking at the region, as Dr. Cho said, is going to be so critical um, that um, I, I would definitely agree that we need to look at numbers. And uh, uh, given what we've seen today and what we've been seeing, I would like to leave pretty much things status quo as they are. Thank you. Thank you. So I can, yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and to echo on uh, Commissioner Egger's comments, and just to remember that we're going to meet again on Tuesday and we're going to be meeting weekly uh, to extend the order. So we'll have every week, we'll have an opportunity to make mm -hmm. adjustments if we see uh, a change in the numbers or some situation that merits that change. So I just want to make that point. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Burton. Yes. In answer to Commissioner Justice's earlier question, the state coordinating officer is the director of emergency management for the state of Florida. Uh, that number is 850-815-4000. That's 850-815-4000. Yes, Commissioner Peters. Um, Barry, have you worked on a plan for getting things open up again, or have you not started working on that? We've, we have frameworks of ideas and, and we kind of outlined some of those, but I think it's very important as a sheriff, you know, discussed how do we, we, we need to work with our municipalities um, and bounce uh, some ideas off of them, especially with regard to the pools and with regard to the beaches. Um, so, so do we, you have a, I'm sorry. Finish, well, we, I'm have sorry. Idea, we have ideas, we need to further develop that. And that's the reason we, we put in our presentation that develop strategies and plans to address pools and beaches. We have ideas, but I think it's too early to roll those out until we have other input um, well, from everybody involved. Okay, well, I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about, have you got that exit strategy, that exit plan? Have we started working on it? Have we gotten serious about it? Are we still in crisis mode or have we started a team that's going to start working on the exit plan? Because I'm very uncomfortable taking away people's rights. It's very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I, I think one of the things we talked about in the previous slide was that the first the first logical place to be on easing of restrictions would be back to a form of the safer at home order uh, to where we're opening businesses up um, with the um, caveat of implementing social distancing practices. Um, so how that works and how we would implement that, but that's the, that's the first place to start. Um, at, at what point? I think that's something we're still trying to figure out. And that is going to be every single strategy we've seen has been part of a larger state strategy. And so we're very interested. So we have ideas and we have that in place. That would be our first um, step that we would recommend. However, it's got to, to do that. We have to see the modification of the governor's order. Um, so that, so that would be our fallback position, our next step. The other piece then, we, we need to develop specific strategies regarding the beach and the pools. Okay, thank you. And again, the beaches and the pools are not in the governor's strategy. And that's, that's correct, that's ours. That's, right, yeah. so thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Mr. Justice, did I address you before? Commissioner Seal, please. try to get her unmuted. Hold on one second. I'm unable to get Commissioner Seal unmuted right now. Oh, there she goes. There she is. Sorry. I'm sorry, my um, mute button wouldn't work, but um, well, yesterday, I, a member of our medical community here in Pinellas County sent me a very, very good roadmap to reopening to the national coronavirus response. Mm -hmm. And I sent it to Barry, the sheriff, and Dr. Cho. I believe that your assistants have it already, but it is a, it mimics everything that Barry has laid out today with the cases declining for 14 days and testing for anyone who um, is, um, has COVID-19 symptoms. And um, that's probably the biggest hurdle we have right now. We don't have the testing capabilities um, here in Pinellas County. So um, I'll make sure that you all receive this roadmap. It um, is done at the national level. Um, it's very comprehensive and um, really lays it out. Thank you. Commissioner you Also, oh. mute yourself back. There's a lot of people that have open microphones. Commissioner Rager? Yeah, and the only other thing I was gonna add is that, um, um, you know, I think that we, our staff and our uh, many of the different committees that have been formed are going to have some of these conversations, I think, that are that are exactly at the, the issue that Commissioner Peters brought up, and that is trying to figure out how we're going to unwind and get back to normal. That is certainly the next phase, and I think that kind of conversation also needs to be taking place with us. Um, and I don't think it means that at the next meeting, when we have a discussion about this issue, that we're going to vote on anything. Um, I guess if I had anything to say about last Monday, is that, you know, I'm sorry that, you know, just a comment or two about a, a thing uh, translated quickly into we're going to take a, a big vote today. And I, that's, you know, I had a part to do with that. I think what we do need to be able to do, however, is to have the conversation and talk amongst ourselves what our staff's uh, uh, coming up with. And even if it's not a final product, uh, Barry, I think it's going to be incumbent upon us to understand it and in terms our residents to understand the things that we're looking at. I think the sheriff said it a couple of times this past week on different things. It's about managing the expectations, managing our expectations, managing our residents' expectations. So I want to make sure that we have some little time reserved at each of our meetings as we go forward to be able to talk about the latest and greatest things that you guys are talking about and preparing even though it may not be ready to mobilize and make a vote on. So that's just the only comment I had. Thank you. That's a good idea. Sheriff? Yeah, yeah, Commissioner, just in response to several of your comments, uh, is that I just want to remind you that, and I believe that you all got it absolutely right, that we got it right in the Safer at Home order that you all put in place uh, a week before the governor's order when you <laughs> said that businesses to operate have to be essential or they absolutely have to comply with the CDC guidelines. And that left open a lot of the businesses that we are getting the most communication from, from the florists, from the car washes, from the dog grooming, from the nail salons, from all of these businesses, they were left open. And in that one week period, if you recall, is, is that we posted all of those 14,000 posters. We had direct contact with all of those businesses. The business community and the consumer community stepped up they did the right thing. And we had those teams of deputies out there across Pinellas County from seven o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. And we did over 4,000 checks of businesses and we were looking for violations and we found violations in less than 1%. That's not statistically invalid. That's not anecdotal. Those are facts. Those are metrics. That's data. And I'd suggest to you what it tells us is that's one of the first things and I'll tell you, that's one of the first things I'm going to recommend to you when you have the power to do it 
when the governor doesn't extend his order anymore, whenever that is, I don't know, or he rescinds the order or he modifies it, is that we should go back to that because it worked. And that will allow these businesses to reopen and deal with those that aren't doing it right on an individual case by case basis. And in that one week, it showed that we can do that. And I think that that is something I know that the administrator and I have discussed, but that's one of the first things that I would suggest that you uh, look at and really keep at the forefront because you can provide some immediate relief. But again, it goes back to, you can't do any of this until the governor either lets his order expire, rescinds it or modifies it. And until that time, that's what we're under. But the people in Pinellas County did step up. The businesses and the consumers, the patrons of these businesses, in that one week period, it showed that they did what we asked them to do. And I think that's a, 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 a number one on the exit strategy list. Thank you. Um, I just wanna circle back to uh, Commissioner Peters, you had a, a motion before. I wanted to make sure that we didn't have a second. I don't see one. Okay. Um, I'm sure we have quite a few citizens would like to address us. At this time, all members of the public who wish to comment on this agenda item should virtually raise their hands by pressing star nine if you're participating via phone or by pressing the raise hand button in the Zoom application. Uh, Madam Chair, we have, give me one second here. We have 17 members of the public that wish to comment on this item. Okay, thank you. And I would ask people to, <laughs> if you're in support or to just keep your brief, your comments short. You have a limit of three minutes, but if you can do your comments in less than that, we'd appreciate it. We'll take the callers in the order that they raise their hands. Our first commenter is Mr. Tom Rask. Mr. Rask, uh, can you hear me? Hang on, Mr. Rask, try to, uh, if you can unmute on your side. Yeah, it took a second. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I the record, Ms. I'm sorry, Mr. Rask, can you uh, say your name, spell it, give us your address, and then we have your three minutes. Okay, yeah, as long as you reset the clock, thank you. My yes, name sir. is Tom Rask, that's uh, R-A-S-K is the last name, and I live in unincorporated Pinellas County. I do support the uh, extension of the SLE, the state of local emergency, but you're talking about a lot of other things here today and you should revisit all your resolutions and administrative orders that are dependent on that SLE, particularly resolution 2023, which gives far too much power to the county administrator. You are letting him make decisions that you should be making. Uh, a lot has been mentioned about these models when this is going to peak. Um, maybe now you can see that a model is just a model. Um, my master's degree was on mathematical modeling, um, and the models are very interesting, uh, but um, they are not reality. And that's going to be true also for climate change models. The county attorney said that the county cannot designate a business as essential, yet the county does exactly that. I sent you an email while you were talking to the county attorney with a copy to the commissioners showing that uh, the county has released a list of newly designated businesses. And I've argued, if I may use that word, with a county administrator. I said, who designated these businesses? Was it your agency? Was it the state? The county administrator says that the county is not adding to the list of essential businesses, yet it's clear that the county is doing and has done exactly that. Several of you said that the citizens have been doing the right thing. You trust the citizens to do the right thing, as Ms. Peters said, but this only seems to apply to pools, but not on beaches. You need to revisit all of these things. Um, it's also been said that people have been well behaved, um, but then at the same time, the statement was made by somebody that we need to manage the pools. Why? If they've been well behaved, why do you need to manage the pools? I don't have a pool, by the way. It's not an issue for me, but it's an issue for a lot of people. The social distancing rules applies regardless of whether you're a pool or not. I don't see what the problem is here. The argument that you create a have and have not situation, you already have that. Some people have pools, some people don't have pools. One option you, you has not been discussed is that you can tell the state they can come here and enforce their executive order. 
That's happening in Michigan in some counties. Uh, you see there's uh, protests and sort of uh, civil disobedience all over the country. Um, the sheriff can choose to tell the governor, well, some of the aspects of this you guys are going to have to enforce. In the end, what I hear is a lot of central planning, which was a central tenet, a key tenet of communism. And trust the people to do the right thing. You said they have, so please step away from all this central planning. That is all I have to say. Thank you. All right, Madam Chair, our next speaker is Mr. Ken Dulac. Mr. Dulac, can you hear me? Uh, please, please unmute your, your microphone. I'm on. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. All right. My name is Ken Dulac, D-U-L-A-C. I live in South St. Petersburg. Um, I'm actually the uh, president of the board of a large condo. We have, uh, it's a high rise building. We have 15 stories, 113 units. Uh, we have people that range in age from newborn to 99. And we have uh, paramedics, we have nurses, we have doctors, we have um, everybody in this building. Um, closing our pool down, we actually closed our pool down a week before you did. And we did that based on our attorney's recommendation that there was liability there, that if we didn't take some action, we would have to face that liability eventually. So we actually did that. And, and then when you took down the pools, you know, basically countywide, we basically, you know, went and rubbed our brows and said, okay, it looks like we did the right thing. The problem that we have is, is that uh, you need to understand, even though we're a large condo, we do not have the, the ability to actually manage the pool. In other words, we don't have lifeguards. We don't have guards. I'm pretty sure the sheriff's not going to loan us a deputy. Um, so if, if you open the pools up again, they are going to be open. And, and you know, we've got 150 people that are going to want to share a, a small pool. Um, you know, there's, there's almost no way that we can manage that on our own. So when you make your decision, I just want you to be aware of there's small ones, as, as Commissioner Peters mentioned, with four or five people. And there's big ones with, you know, 150 people trying to share one fairly small pool. And, you know, your decision is going to affect us as well as the little folks, you know. So we'll have people in there swimming and I don't know how to keep them apart, to be honest with you. I, I don't think the sheriff wants us out there trying to play police officers, getting in the middle of fights and arguing with people about who gets in and who doesn't. So that was my comment. I wanted just to make you aware of, you know, I'm an also a small elected official, but. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I have a comment on that. Um, every HOA would have the authority to close down their own pools if they want to. Right now, we took their rights away from them. And if we gave it back to them, they'd still have the right to close down their pool if it's a large pool and they felt they couldn't handle it. And I just want to make that comment to that gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Tammy Vasquez. Ms. Vasquez, can you hear me okay? Uh, you have to unmute on your your side. Got it. I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, please uh, state your name, spell it, and give us your address, please. Yes, this. Uh, my name is Tammy Vasquez, V-A-S-Q-U-E-Z, and I reside in Treasure Island. Did you need my full address or just that? <laughs> no, that's fine. Thank you. All right. Good morning, commissioners, Sheriff Galtieri, uh, Administrator Burton, and everyone else joining this morning. Um, first, I want to thank you guys for working so hard to keep all the citizens in Pinellas County safe. Um, this is so unprecedented, and we know you guys are all working so hard, and we appreciate that. Um, I'm speaking today um, on pet grooming. Um, my husband and myself um, own Bark Life. We have two locations here in Pinellas County. I'm speaking today to state the reasons we believe pet grooming is indeed already deemed essential in the governor's order and why. Not only do we, but multiple other counties and and in the state believe the same. And a few of the counties that have already deemed grooming essential are Hillsboro, Polk, Leon, Brevard, Broward, Charlotte, and many counties I don't have time to mention. I'm sure you've read hundreds of, <laughs> if not thousands of emails as to the health of the pets in which we agree. However, 
I'm here with proof as to why we and other county officials and sheriffs statewide believe we are already legally deemed essential in the governor's order, therefore by law. For the record, in our industry, pet stores, pet sitting, pet boarding, and pet daycare have already been deemed essential by the state and local governments, including Pinellas County. But pet grooming is the only thing left out in Pinellas County, yet it is needed to perform two of our four essential services. Plus, there is no difference in the way grooming clients' pets are received and handled than is when, we, uh, when they come for boarding or daycare. I sent all of you an email yesterday with not only the governor's order where under essential activities paragraph three where it states pet care, I also included the document from the Florida Homeland Security via the governor that was sent out to all local governments to help define the original order. Under infrastructure and support services paragraph two, service providers who provide services that are necessary to maintain the safety and sanitation of a simple operation, essential operations in residents and businesses. Our interpretation is daycare and boarding facilities must include the bathing of pets when they come in to kill fleas and ticks, plus for the sanitary cleanliness of the facility. Nails must also be trimmed as to not injure themselves or the staff. At this time, we can do none of this under the county's ban on grooming. Under essential shelter facilities and services, paragraph three, workers in animal shelters, our interpretation. Animals come into shelters infested with fleas and ticks and extremely matted and must be shaved down and bathed by professional groomers. Plus the pets in the shelter must be bathed and groomed regularly to maintain a sanitary environment. At this time, none of this can be done under the county's ban on grooming. Paragraph seven, workers performing services in support of the elderly and disabled population. Our interpretation, service dogs must be bathed and groomed weekly or bi-weekly to maintain a sanitary animal. These dogs go into grocery stores, doctor's offices, and more. It is imperative that these animals are kept groomed and due to the owner's disabilities, they cannot care for the animals themselves. I'm sure you can see why we believe we are within our legal rights to be deemed essential. I'm asking that you- Madam Chair, I'm sorry, time has expired, uh, just, just as an FYI. Oh, I just almost done, if you don't mind. I'm just asking that you vote immediately to reopen pet grooming so that we and others can perform, perform all of our essential services. Thank you guys so much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Mr. Neil Valk. Mr. Valk, go ahead and unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Madam Chair, I may request probably a little extra time because I represent the Express War Car Wash Coalition which consists of five express car washers in 13 locations. I know- I'm sorry, I've, you have three minutes. Okay. Um, we have over 30,000 members and 60,000 customers. I've sent you numerous emails in regards to why uh, car washers are essential. We've had these conversations back and forth, Janet, David, all of us have talked about it. I've talked to the sheriff and Barry as well, but, there are, an average vehicle has about 283 different types of bacteria in every square centimeter, according to the study by the Austin University in Birmingham. Express cars are, can disinfect 500 to 800 cars a day at each location. This helps eliminate the COVID-19 and re reduces allergens as well as provide care and maintenance to the vehicles. The COVID-19 virus is reported to live on surfaces for several days. Express Car Wash serves members, which include essential workers, such as for hire vehicles, including cabs, Ubers, being used for citizens to conduct essential fun functions, like going to the grocery store, pharmacy and healthcare appointed, as well as essential jobs. Additionally, they, the facilities serve thousands of medical and law enforcement uh, vehicles, currently being used as essential workers perform duties and travel essential jobs. According to the governor's order, we understand that the, a retail business operation in organization is not included in the category of essential business and essential activities as defined in the governor's order. 
as it may be amended or submit, must close. And Bob and I have talked about that. But essential services are to be included those business activity designated by the executive order and its attachment is consistent with the list propounded by the Miami-Dade County multiple orders. A, the EO-2189, a facility deemed non-essential pursuant to the guideline of the state of Miami-Dade pursuant to it, March 19, emergency order. According to Miami-Dade, which the governor has referred to, Ordinance, page 25, gas stations, auto supply, auto repair, and related facilities are essential. Car washers fall under the North American Industry Classification 81190 Automotive Repair and Maintenance. Thus, this is included in Central Governor's Order. Car washers in Tallahassee are open. Car washers in Miami-Dade are open. We are respectfully asking the Pinellas County Board to consider express car doors as essential as the governor order and the board's directions and other related automotive facilities. Mr. And Walk, your, your time has expired. Okay, can I finish just one thing? We spoke to the Emergency Operations Center and they said it is up to you. Thank you for exactly. your time. Thank you. <clears throat> And I'm sure our next speaker is Jonathan Luce. Mr. Luce, please unmute yourself. Uh, go ahead and state your name and spell it. Uh, give us your address for the record, please. Uh, first name's Jonathan, last name is Los, uh, and I'm in Madeira Beach. Um, I want to uh, first thank you for considering, even though it doesn't look like it's gonna happen today, opening the beaches and return uh, access to the private pools at a time where many local locales, government mayors seem to have lost their minds by restricting access to outdoor space. I commend you for at least thinking about moving in the, the right direction. Um, I just want to remind that increasing access to outdoor space is not lifting social distancing restrictions. You guys are already doing a good job at this. Uh, people have access to most parks and trails. Um, they, they have seemed to be complying with the social distancing aspect and people are left uh, by biking and walking on sidewalks, three foot wide, four foot wide trails. People even have the ability to boat although it's still unclear how it's justified to have 10 people contained on a deck of a boat, but not a deck of a private pool. Uh, just again, the key point here with the, the data that uh, Mr. Burton had presented, that social distancing, not the shelter in place, is the effective strategy. We want to remind that social distancing and lockdown are not mutually exclusive. Lockdowns and closures are just forced compliance of the social distancing. And there's emerging evidence, emerging evidence now that looks at that the data that Mr. Burton had presented, although a great um, presentation, is not unique. And uh, Commissioner Peters, you're correct. You can't look at the total cases. They'll never drop. You have to look at the, the, the new daily active cases. Those are the metrics that are looking at whether we peaked or what's happening to the curve. Um, this pattern that's emerging is that there are many places that have not had stay-at-home orders or shelter in place and they have the similar pattern or uh, a display of information. Uh, the one thing that has been unique amongst all these locales has been the, so the CDC guidelines for social distancing. Um, there's just really no difference in the pattern of infection. The flattening of the curve was meant to be the initial uh, mitigation strategy, but it's not the exit strategy that's going to be successful for this. Um, you, you can't expect it to have zero cases or no cases. This is gonna uh, have, uh, play, its, play its way out and it's gonna follow like most pandemics this kind of bell curve. Um, that was only really meant to prevent saturation of our healthcare system. And with the numbers you're showing there, we, we, our first case in Pinellas County was on uh, I think March 11th and we've had 500, about 500 cases to date and only 87 hospitalizations and uh, you know, 3,300 staff beds, 285 ICU beds. Uh, you know, with, the, with the rate at which we're going, I mean, we peaked on April 1st. That was what the peak was. And we were doubling every two or three days. That doubling was the fear uh, that we were on this crazy um, spike. And uh, where we're at today at 500 beds, we, didn't do we doubled from March, uh, I'm sorry, April 2nd, April 3rd, from 239, 318 cases, it took 12 days to double. That fear of doubling is, is not there. So uh, you're expecting another doubling for this peak to happen. It's gonna be maybe four months out. So I know Dr. Chol uh, brought up the IHME model, but that has been wrong on almost every account. Uh, the modeling is, is inconsistent at best. 
Um, I think the sheriff department has good leadership and is more than capable to uh, to manage these uh, the pool aspects. I think Commissioner Peters is correct. Um, Hello, to, your, your time has expired. Sure, I'll. Uh, I know you guys got a lot of uh, point here, but uh, just I think returning power to people and looking at real data, not the total cases. You got to be smart on what data you're looking at. But thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Cheryl Murray Powell. Uh, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, state your name, spell your name, and give us the address for the record, please. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Cheryl Murray Powell. I'm a, an agricultural attorney. Um, my name is spelled S-C-H-E-R-I-L-M-U-R-R-A-Y-P-O-W-E-L-L. -L. Um, I represent Sunflora Inc., um, also known in the community as your CBD store. We have 600 stores across the country, 80 in the state of Florida. And uh, the reason why I am um, appealing to the commission um, is because we are designated as food. Um, by statute, hemp extract is designated as food. Um, there was guidance from the governor's office as far as what is essential, what is not essential. He pointed to Homeland Security's guidance. Um, and it's very clear that food is considered essential. Each of our store locations have received a food certificate from the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. I am also the former director of federal affairs for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. I think it, it is an error that you would consider a store that has a food permit issued by the state of Florida where by statute, um, hemp extract is considered to be a food. It is an error for law, law enforcement to go into those stores and order them to close. In consideration of consumer safety and uh, our employee safety, we've already taken due diligence of instructing our owners to do only curbside service. But we recently had officers in store ordering our stores to close down when our products are considered to be food and therefore essential. Um, even if um, Attorney White's assertion is correct as far as the county being able to be more strict um, than the state, it doesn't mean that the county can declassify a food item from being food. So I am appealing to you to make sure that we don't have this disruption of the service that we provide to our consumers, getting them the nutrition that they've come to rely on um, by having law enforcement go to our stores, ordering them to be closed in violation of state law, in violation of the guidance from Homeland Security, and in violation of the guidance that is present on the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Sure, uh, Sheriff Galtier. Everybody's benefit. Uh, that attorney sent a letter yesterday. Uh, we just received it yesterday. It's sitting on my desk. And when we get down here this morning, we'll address it. So that's an example of we're going to look at them on an individual basis where there is room for uh, evaluation. And I'll do that this morning. So, um, you know, she just said it yesterday and you know, she just called in now, but we will evaluate that one and you know, make an individual determination on it because on the surface, there do appear to be some uh, some validity to her position, but we'll we'll look at that one. Thank you. Do we have another speaker? Oh, oh I'm sorry, Mr. Sure I, I just I, I didn't hear her in the very beginning, and I, I felt terrible. What was the industry that she was talking about? I I'm I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. It's it, it, it's it's uh, CDB CBD hemp, okay, which would be the 0 .0 per, 0 0.03 percent uh, or uh, lower, and it's food products, uh, which is different from smokables, different from vape, different from uh, those stores that are selling the eating, um, smoking in the tobacco shops. And if it is in fact food, um, then that's something we're going to evaluate. So it's really CBD based food is what her concern is. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Ms. Sharon Calvert. 
Uh, Ms. Calvert, if you would go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, give us your name, spell your name, address, and uh, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. This is Sharon Calvert, S-H-A-R-O-N-C-A-L-V-E-R-T, and I'm in Tierra Verde. Um, I'd like to put some context on the numbers, and I, and I will tell you, I'm very, very thankful that in Florida, as the third largest state in the country, I think we have done very well. Um, and the Tampa Bay area in, in particular. So when you look at the overall number of cases in Pinellas County, the 520 cases of the 22,897 reported by the FDOH web, uh, tracking website, it's in Pinellas County, it's 2.3% of overall Florida cases. On the hospitalizations, uh, Pinellas County has had 104, which is 3.1% of the 3,305. And on, unfortunately, on the deaths, there's been 14 in Pinellas, which is 2.2% of the 633. So again, um, then the actual data in, in Pinellas County is showing that the vast majority of the residents here are thankfully abiding by um, the emergency orders and the social distancing. Um, and, and that by being said, uh, I understand there's models, but and, and we have to be looking at the models as a forward projection. However, as uh, Mr. Burton uh, stated previously, the conditions on the ground and the actual data changes those models. And at some point in time, um, you know, you have to look at both of them on the policy making side. Um, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Peters and her attempt to try to open up some of the pools. Um, I do believe that there are studies that have shown that being outside in the sunshine and some fresh air is, um, is very good. Uh, we need our vitamin D, it's an antioxidant and in, in, uh, it increases our immunity and it's good for both our mental and our physical health. So um, I look forward to seeing the progress on the exit strategy. I wish that you would re reconsider um, the pool issue and I will stay that I, I walk the Bayway almost every day to get outside and get my sunshine. Um, and I am seeing the sheriff's deputies. I mean, they're already patrolling what I see as the empty pools. <laughs> um, and I do believe that, you know, again, the homeowners association of those condos and my, my condo is only 16 units and there's never, there's never 10 people in the pool. And I know that we've gone over this issue, but I'm on the canal and I'm watching boats go by much smaller than my pool. Um, and there, it's probably harder for them to social distance. Not that I want you to close down boating because I have a boat too. <laughs> um, but again, I appreciate the effort that you're taking. I know it is something we haven't seen in our lifetime, um, but we must have an exit strategy and we must remember Again, as the previous speaker said, the intent of the shutdown um, and these orders was to flatten the curve so that our medical resources and our Ms. medical Calvert, personnel are not overrun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, our next speaker is Rob Schuler. Uh, Mr. Schuler, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, give us your name, your last name, address, and um, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Mr. Schuler. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Rob Schuler. I live on Beach Drive. Uh, I've watched the entirety of the session this morning, and it's uh, confusing and a bit frustrating. On one hand, um, it seems to be that everyone is saying we have to adhere to the governor's executive order, and we have little or no choice. On the other hand, the governor's executive order specifically allows swimming. So how does one swim if one can't access a pool or a beach? Um, the governor, it, it, the county does appear to have the authority to open up the pools. And there are a number of people that rely on these for their exercise. Um, I know one person that is on our condo building that is an amputee. And if he gains more than five pounds, he cannot use his prosthesis. His only form of exercise is the swimming pool. As to the uh, city or county attorney saying that you've already received a lawsuit, What's going to happen when you start getting ADA lawsuits because there's no reasonable accommodation? Reasonable accommodation would suggest that uh, you can open the pools as other counties have. Dr. Fauci, on the day that the pools were closed, stated pools were not unsafe, that the disease is not transmitted here. 
And so you're taking the pools like ours. We have over 10,000 square feet on our pool deck and we were told it was closed. Um, the sheriff's office informed our building that we were not allowed to access our grill because it is close to the pool and on the same pool deck. So there are some arbitrary decisions being made. And it, it seems that if the county wants to allow folks to enjoy their, their pools and enjoy the benefits of it, that they have the authority to do so and not state that they can't do so because of the governor's executive order. I support Commissioner Peter's efforts to make this um, and bring up this issue and certainly would hope that um, you would understand that pools are a much better place than if those 10 people were to go crowd on to a public bus, not knowing who was on there or who's touched it beforehand, which is permissible. Thank you. Okay, Madam Chair, our next speaker is someone calling on the phone line, last four digits, 5301. If you'll give us your name, spell your name, give us your address, and uh, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Yes, this is Michael Shelley. I live in North Reddington Beach, and I'd like to the, speak to the point of the blanket closure of the HOA pools. Uh, Commissioner Peters started to address on it a little bit, and uh, I'm sorry, my last name spelled S-H-E-L-L-E-Y. Commissioner Peters started to address the differences in the pool sizes, and uh, no one's directly addressed the Florida Statute 33, Chapter 514.0015, Paragraph 2A, specifically designates private versus public HOA pools, where the line is 32 units. So I would like to hear your board address the difference between the private and the public HOA pools and how you have the authority to override that Florida statute uh, dictating the small HOAs, such as, like I said, under 32 units and not allowing them to have their use their pools. I actually did follow the guidelines to submit the comments and participate in today's meeting, but for some reason, my uh, email and attachments weren't in the agenda with all that outlined all this. And then, I, like the previous caller stated, I'd like to reiterate that the CDC specifically says that this is not uh, spread through swimming pools. And to the sheriff's comment about penicillin, you have to finish the uh, prescription to be able to get through it. Well, also, if you don't have an ailment and you take penicillin and you continue to take it, it creates a larger problem. And I think that's where we're at today. So if you could please discuss the private versus uh, public HOA pools with, <coughs> with the 32 units drawing the line. And again, I submit support Commissioner Peters and her motion to uh, open HOA pools. At a minimum, uh, the private pools under 32 units, just like single family homes where the neighbor comes over. There's no difference. Thank you, that's all. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, our next speaker is Danielle Siliento. Uh, Ms. Siliento, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself, uh, giving us your name, spelling your name, giving us your address, and then you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Bye. Hi, my name is Danielle Chiliento. That's D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E-C-I-L-I-E-N-T-O. Um, I live in Bel Air, Florida. Um, I'm actually a Clearwater native, born and raised here, and I've lived here all my life. And I'm, I was calling in today. I'm a little disappointed that the vote for the beach didn't go through as I thought it would. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm asking you to please consider reopening the beaches. Um, I'm a mother of three small children, all under the age of 10. I'm trying diligently to homeschool them and make this as painless as possible for my children. So after hours and hours of screen time and workbooks, my children and I need to get outside. And in my small town of Bel Air, they have started posting threatening signs in every piece of green space. I even had someone fly a drone on my children for riding bikes in the local park square. The playgrounds are closed, the rec center is closed. Um, excuse me just a second. A month ago, when this began, I watched as everything began to close, but the one thing I couldn't believe was ever possible to ever close was the beach. I figured that no matter what, we would at least have that to get out and, and enjoy during this time of hardship. Um, our county is a peninsula surrounded by three sides by miles and miles of coastline. I couldn't believe that that would actually be closed. And if I wasn't panicked before, well, then I definitely was 
now. I don't think panic and pandemonium are good in any community or circumstance. And I really feel sad that I'm living in a world right now where the only options for our right now feels like to tell my kids to hide under the bed or maybe we can go to Publix. Um, the governor's order allows for recreation, but where? Sunshine and salt water, I think are essential in my life. And I believe for many of members of our community, I'm hearing that the suicide hotline is increasing, child protect protective services are having trouble getting to everyone, opioid and substance abuse is on the rise, domestic abuse victims are being made to stay inside with their abusers, children have lost their structure of school, many are hungry and needing food. I think that the new unemployment numbers are astronomical. Um, our community needs to be able to get outside and get fresh air. Our children need to be able to get outside. We live here because of the beaches. I understand you may not be able to just flip the light switch on regarding the beach, but if we could just think of it as like a three-way bulb, um, start with recreation, give us an outlet, give us hope, a walk on the beach, sun, salt water, salt air, just give us the opportunity to walk on the beach. If I can take my kids on a beach walk, collect seashells and be out in nature, I know that my family will be better for it. And I believe many other families will be as well. So I'm just asking today, it doesn't sound like it's going for a vote, but please consider all of the families out there that we're trying our best to get by, but we need places to go. And um, Siliento, your time is up. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, our next speaker is Megan Chapman. Uh, Ms. Chapman, if you would go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, give us your name, spell your name, give us your address, and then you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Hi, yeah, this is actually Matt Chapman, uh, M-A-T-T, -E. oh, no, no problem, it's my wife's computer, uh, C-H-A, you can call M-A-N, uh, we're at, uh, we're in Clearwater, Florida, um, so just want to echo what's uh, been obviously a popular theme here that I think uh, closing private community pools is a massive overreach, um, as has been explained, if certain communities decide they can't do that uh, in, in what they feel is a healthy manner, they obviously can make those decisions on their own. Um, I understand, as the vice chairman said, that there are going to be people who express that they don't want people using pools. As I understand it, giving people the freedom to use a pool does not compel them to do so. So people who don't want pools open can certainly choose not to use a pool um, rather than you know, make decisions for the rest of us. Uh, again, also on, uh, regarding the models, um, I'm a little concerned as, a, as some people have already expressed that we continue to talk so much about models rather than the actual numbers. The eff efficacy of the models have been putrid. Um, we're now providing basically intellectual cover for how horrible they've been the entire time by saying, the, the narrative at first was, hey, you idiots, you're not staying home. Uh, we, we've got these models, we've got to flatten the curve. The, the models, most of them that I've seen, take into account social distancing measures. Now we're providing intellectual cover by saying, great job guys, you guys stayed home. Well, guess what? The models that you used were wrong using, using the social distancing measures and they're, they continue to be wrong. So uh, you continue to talk about when we can go back to our normal life based on models that have been wrong since day one, using all the, all the things that we said we were gonna do, staying at home and, and all that, uh, I was happy to hear some of the, the, the numbers that the other lady presented and to get perspectives. Um, I did see, I think yesterday, I, I saw um, uh, for March, the last couple of years that we're talking about basically, you know, what would be 2% of deaths across America. And I think that the numbers she, she gave pretty much correlated to that here locally as well. Um, so I think we needed to, to you know, a, a real, you know, adult conversation is how long do we continue doing this, you know, this 2% of what on the average, you know, the average year deaths, does, does that, you know, justify some of the actions that we're doing? At, at some point, um, you know, there, there needs to be conversations with real numbers, with real perspectives um, and applying, you know, again, we've had 14 deaths here in Pinellas County. What in a, in a mean, you know, year rolling over five, 10 years, how many deaths occur from influenza, from pneumonia, can we, can we get some numbers that provide some perspective? If you put a ticker on every death for every cause of, of every, or, or every person who's diagnosed with an illness, you'd have to put uh, Prozac in the water. So I think people have their perspective skewed because we keep this rolling total. 
Um, and again, as someone made the point as well, that we're, we're using the numbers, we're talking about total cases, people who, who you know, are tested and have it. Chad Minier's time has expired. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Cameron Kelly. Uh, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, state your name, spell your name, give us your address, and uh, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cameron Kelly. I live in Palm Harbor, and I run the Flower Rama in Clearwater at 2001 Drew Street. Um, I respect everybody's time and, and everything y'all have been saying here. My um, questions are really just kind of unique in that Mother's Day is coming up. I know we're not essential. Um, my question is more about planning for the holiday because if we're going by the governor's order that would expire on the 30th, I need to bring in product to my store no later than the 30th. Um, and I need staff to be able to process that. So I'm just looking for clarification on, um, you know, um, am I allowed um, based on the rules and regulations right now to have staff in the store prepping for the holiday if we are in fact not open for business? That's my first question. Am I allowed to do that? Just doing the prep work um, in preparation for the holiday. Um, that's question one. Question two is based on the original order from the governor. It said businesses and organizations are encouraged to continue to make deliveries and curbside pickup. Um, if the governor's order would be extended um, beyond the 30th, because um, we have been closed, uh, would we then be allowed, if it is extended, to make deliveries? Are we allowed to do that now? What is the actual language of that order mean? We are closed for business, but if we are closed and we have people making uh, floral arrangements, are we then are we allowed to deliver those arrangements if we are closed to the public? I'm just looking for clarification on that. And um, just trying to plan for this holiday, if we are going to be allowed to be open, which Mother's Day is May 10th, it does take us about a week and a half to amp up for that. We have to order a refrigerated truck onto the property and again, receive our product on no later than the 30th. Um, my last question would be, I heard uh, Mr. Burton, I think, um, put out the phone number 850-815-4000, but I didn't catch what that phone number was. And I was wondering if that was the phone number for the state coordinating officer um, that we were talking about earlier, I wrote it down, but I, I didn't catch what it was for. So just from a standpoint of um, enforcement also for the sheriff, you know, if I have employees in the store amping up for the holiday, but we're closed for business, is that allowed? Um, those are basically my questions. I know it's I know it's so gray and so hard to answer and, I, and I'm just looking for guidance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sheriff. Yeah, if if uh, Mr. Zumwalt or somebody can get her phone number and then send it to me, I'll call her and talk to her. Sure, I can do that. And that and that was the state coordinating office number. Uh, Madam Chair, our next speaker is Frank Orbello. Uh, Mr. Orbello, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, give us your name, spell your name, give us your address, and then you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning. This is Frank Orobello, O-R-O-B-E-L-L-O. -L -L -O. Um, Leelman, St. Pete is where I reside. Uh, I'm just going to touch on some points that Neil brought up with the Car Wash Coalition. Um, as all of you talked about, uh, Sheriff, um, Mr. Welch talked about the stresses on the police officers, the stresses on the economy. We do own a car wash. We're not deemed essential because of one word, maintenance. Hillsborough County and Pinellas County removed the word maintenance from the governor's uh, distinction. The governor said auto repair or maintenance. You guys just kept auto repair. We are able to follow all CDC guidelines. We may not be essential, but we are essential to the essential workers. Grubhub, Uber, people who drive around the elderly, the police officers, they have an opportunity to clean the inside and outside of their cars. If you live in an apartment building or a condo facility, you don't have that ability anymore. You're not able to, to create a safe space for the people you are driving around or the items you are bringing to other people. If we were allowed to stay open as a car wash industry, 
there's six of us or seven companies right now that are all family owned that each contribute monthly um, to the, the revenue that the, the county can take in and we can safely uh, provide a service to our customers. We are easily able to stay six feet apart. All our employees have masks and gloves and we have cleaning supplies. So to, to argue over a very small word of maintenance, if we are able to stay open, we won't put that stress on the economy. I won't be applying for triple P program. Um, I'll have a, a, in my employees have able to not have to go on to unemployment. 5.2 million people last week applied for unemployment. 25 million people have applied thus far. $349 billion was, was allocated for the triple P program, yet 329 billion has already been used. So they're gonna run out of money. So now you're telling a company that can follow the guidelines has to close and apply for these things when we wouldn't have to. So the, the officer or the officers could come around and say, hey, Frank, or hey, Neil, or hey, uh, any other company, you're not following CDC guidelines. You have to close. That's where these resources need to be kept. Same thing with the pools. If people are not able to follow the CDC guidelines, that's when it should be closed down. Not this blanket statement where each individual county has the ability to interpret the law. Mr. Arbella, your time has expired. I have one question for, for Sheriff. Um, what <laughs> law are we breaking if we are if we are adhering to all CDC guidelines? We want the next one, Madam Chair? Yes, please. Okay, the next speaker is Brian Sykes. Uh, Mr. Sykes, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, give us your name, last name, address, and then uh, you'll have three minutes. Thank you, Sykes. If you'll go ahead and unmute yourself. And if you could turn down your TV in the background, that would also be helpful. Name, Thank you. last name, address, and then uh, you'll have three minutes. And if you could turn down your TV in the background, that would also help me. My last name, address, Mr. Sykes? Yes. My name is Brian Sykes, S-Y-K-E-S, -E and I'm in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, I first would like to thank uh, all the commissioners for the work they're doing to keep us safe and the, uh, all the hard work uh, everyone's doing to try to support our county in a very difficult time. I run in absolutely beautiful flowers. We have almost 40 people that depend on our organization for employment. What the prior speaker said in regards to if we were open and operating, we wouldn't have to apply for grants or have those people be unemployed. But more importantly is the fact that flowers in the vast part of the state and in the vast part of the United States are determined, determined to be essential businesses. In Miami-Dade, all flower shops are open and delivering. In Hillsborough County, all flower shops are open and delivering. In Manatee County, all flower shops are open and delivering. Flower shops are under the food and agriculture uh, part of the governor's order, support of retail services for online retail. Flower shops have not been open for several weeks for public to walk in and buy flowers. They've only been delivering e-commerce orders that were enacted by either an order online or by a telephone order, which is another part of the governor's order. Finally, we're a key part of the delivery services of people's needs. We deliver food in the form of gift baskets, gourmet baskets, fruit baskets. The other point that really needs to be honed in is that flower shops are an essential business that's a retail operation that is online only right now. And it supports, more importantly, the very sad occurrence of people passing away. And when people pass away, they want to have flowers at their funeral. Currently, if there's a funeral in Pinellas County, those flowers are either gonna come from Hillsborough County or Manatee County and the flower shops in Pinellas County will not be serviced. I understand that there's confusion. 
flower shops are very easy to support the COVID-19 CDC guidelines and regulations. Drivers are very safe and do touchless deliveries. Shops have all implemented more than seven feet rule. We can easily and safely do this. I know Mr. several- Your, your time has expired, sir. From FTD. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, there are five remaining speakers with their hands raised. Um, you wanna continue? Yes, please. Okay. Our next speaker is James, uh, did not provide a last name. Uh, James, if you go ahead and unmute yourself, give us your name first and last, uh, spell it, give us your address, and then you'll have three minutes, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is James Keene. I'm calling from St. Petersburg, Florida. I'd like to thank all of you for your leadership in keeping us safe, uh, residents of Pinellas County, safe from a global health crisis. It's a global pandemic. And uh, I'm really struck by the comments of folks wanting exceptions and wanting to um, move things forward quickly. Um, because we've got to get back to it. Well, actually, in my opinion, we don't need to just get back to it. We need to be mindful of the health of our residents. And the number of cases that we have today is because we've been socially distancing. So why would we then now decide is the time to start removing some of those restrictions that have been successful? Because um, if condos want to open their pool, go ahead, let them open it. And everybody just sign a waiver that when you need a vent, you don't get one. And anyone who wants to play, you know, these ridiculous games, um, then all right, well, maybe you can do that. But we have this form for you to sign that you decided that it was more important to wash cars for uh, essential uh, employees and to deliver flowers. I'd love to send flowers, but I mean, there are people who don't have food. There are people that, you know, like, come on. You, you, I think you've been doing a great job of, of walking the line of our poor leadership from the governor and uh, within the county, you've really worked hard to keep us safe. So I would encourage you to stay strong in keeping us safe, commissioners. And um, I am for keeping the restrictions as is. It's a difficult time. Nobody said it would be easy. The alternative is death, more death in Pinellas County. Thank you for your common sense. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, our next speaker is Marilyn Thurman. Terman? Uh, Ms. Terman, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, give us your first and last name, uh, spell your name, give us your address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Absolutely. It's Marilyn Terman. It's M-A-R-I-L-Y-N, Terman, T-U-R-M-A-N, from Clearwater, Florida. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Okay, I wanna make sure I was unmuted there, okay? Good deal. Well, thank you again. I appreciate, uh, very appreciative of all you all have done. Um, this is not easy for any of us. Um, I'm hearing um, people talking about, you know, the beaches and the pools. I understand we need recreation. People are, are literally just, <laughs> we're in a very uncomfortable place right now. None of us uh, ordered this to happen, but we're in it. Um, and we just, we have to find a way to get through this and keep people safe. Uh, the first concern that I have is um, in reference to testing. You know, I, I was listening to the first portion of the meeting where we had the presentation with the curb and the numbers of cases that we have, but if we've only tested um, a small fraction of the population, how do we really know? I, I think that's the main thing is we need to know how many people um, are actually infected. Um, people who are asymptomatic can still be walking around, you know, um, exposing people. We don't know. I could have it today and not know it, though I feel well. Um, and so I think that's one of the biggest things that we need to do is we need to talk about the testing. We need to make sure that the people um, in our communities or in our county that we know where the testing is and we need to make it available for all people. Um, and then also too, um, if, if we were, Sheriff Gualtieri talked about um, as we transition back and even before the governor's order that people were, um, they were doing a pretty good job of practicing social distancing. I know that at, at my church, we've been um, doing feeding for the people in the community and we've got a process in place where we're practicing the six feet 
as we provide food. And I'll tell you, we served over 200 meals. Um, so there's a way to do it. But there's an industry that I know right now is really suffering, and that is the uh, beauty and the bar beauticians and the barbers. Now, I'm not one, but what I can tell you about them is, as I look at the photos of everybody on this video, you all look great. Your hair looks great. Your your present okay yes for those of you who have it thank you um, but the point is um, you, you know you are requiring people I mean you, you we don't want our judges and our deputies and our you know our, our folk coming into their places of business not looking kept up but here's what I want to say real quick because I know my time's running out we have put together a video a video that will demonstrate on behalf of that industry how they can actually implement. Um, processes and serving people using the guidelines that have been put in place. Um, and I've talked to a number of them um, and I, I would like to at least submit it. And if there is an opportunity, I just want it to be considered because when I think about liquor stores being an essential business, now I understand a little you Ms. know. Ms. German, your, your time has expired. Okay. All right. Well, thank you anyway. I will send it over. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Madam Speaker, our next speaker does not have his name listed or her name listed. Um, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, give us your first, last name, uh, spelling, and then your address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is uh, Dan Berlin, and I'm at 6279 Sun Boulevard, St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, listening to this, and I appreciate everybody's time and the availability to have input into this, Pulling out the governor's order on page four, section three, it specifies participating in recreational activities. Uh, and it states in there that an essential activity is swimming. Now, I've heard a few of the members, and I don't remember exactly who they were, saying that you can't liberalize the governor's rules, but you can be more restrictive. So it appears that. Um, you've gone in the direction of being more restrictive because you've eliminated swimming. So then anyways, I pulled up the resolution that the county passed, resolution 2020. And on page two, section eight, uh, it specifically lists as place of public assembly are ordered to close. And in this order on that section, in that paragraph, it says publicly accessible pools. And it does not say private pools. And HOAs, depending on the size, are private pools. There's no guidelines as far as the interpretation of what publicly accessible is, unless you go to the fire code for the state. And in the fire code, section 101-3.31882, it describes publicly accessible as any facility, indoor or outdoor, constructed for the use of 50 or more people. So my point is, if you're following your resolution, you're following the state law, these HOA pools do not fall under publicly accessible. And furthermore, as far as a health benefit, on March 28, 2020, the Center for Disease put out a question and answer. And with regards to the spreadability of COVID-19 through pools and hot tubs, there is no evidence that it can be spread through pools or hot tubs. In fact, it states that it kills the virus. So you're actually taking something away from the residents of Pinellas County by not letting them swim in private pools. And the last question I got is notices that are being put up by the sheriff and by the commissioner, they've changed the wording and they added the word private to your resolution. And I don't see where that was voted on. And so I'm just kind of confused. It doesn't appear that you're following the resolution that you passed. And thank you for your time. I appreciate it and everybody stay healthy. Thank you. Sorry, unmute myself. Uh, Madam Chair, our next speaker is uh, Mary Riggin. Uh, Ms. Riggin, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, give us your spelling of your name, your address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, pretty well. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Um, my, uh, Mary Riggin, R-I-G-G-I-N. I'm in Safety Harbor, 3339 Briarwood Circle. I have a, uh, I'm a licensed acupuncturist, have been since 1996. And I just wanted to clarify with this uh, commission board that the licensed practice of acupuncture is in fact a form of primary health care as defined by Florida statute 456 and 457. And I just wanted to make that comment to clarify the misinformation that was stated earlier in this meeting. That's all. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, we have two remaining speakers. Uh, our next speaker is Chris Mansueto. I might be saying that wrong. Uh, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, give us your name, uh, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Can you hear us? Hello? Hello? All right, Madam Chair, we'll go on to the next speaker, uh, Mr. Scott Schuler. Mr. Schuler, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, give us your name, spelling, address, and uh, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. My name is Scott Schuyler. I spoke at your meeting on Monday. My uh, spelling of my last name is S-T-H-U-Y-L-E-R. My address is 2863 6th Avenue South, St. Petersburg, Florida. I'm calling um, on behalf of dog groomers. Again, I'm trying to get my dog to see one. Um, and I was reading on the federal level that they deem dog groomers essential. I would like for you guys to keep that in mind when you guys make this decision or are looking for the information. If it's out there federally, states should adopt it, especially if it makes sense. Essentially, if your dogs are not healthy, your family can become sick. Skin care for dogs is one of the most important things, you know, next to them, among the other things, getting them shot records and all that stuff taken care of. Also, dogs' vaccines have the COVID uh, vaccine in it. If your dog's vaccines are up to date, there's no way for your dog to get sick. So then there's no way for your dog to pass it on to you. Thank you very much for your time. I really hope that these, this information is considered and kept in mind. This is not about money. This is about the health of our animals, which in turn goes along with health of our family. Thank you very much. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, I understand that our mayor, Frank Hibbard, called in and he inadvertently got knocked off. And so my understanding is he's listening now. Brian, I don't know if you can see that he is called in. Let's see here. I did not see his name listed unless he's calling in on a phone line. I would need to know what number that is, uh, Commissioner Long. I'll ask him. Hold on just a minute. Or he can, or if he can raise his hand in the in the meeting, we can certainly patch. Him. It'd be star nine on his phone. Did you hear that, Frank? I think we have him now. <clears throat> Mr. Hibbert, can you hear us? Yes, I can. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Very good. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Long. Good morning, Commissioner, Sheriff, City Administrator. Good morning. Uh, this is Frank Hibbert, Mayor of the city of Clearwater. I wanted to thank you all for having this conversation today. Uh, it has been a thoughtful one. No one wants businesses or the beaches to open more than myself, but I appreciate the fact that you are holding off on reopening the beach at this time. I believe it will be soon, but not yet. Our staff has been putting together a robust plan to keep people safe when the beaches and businesses reopen. And I hope that we can just work in cooperation to put these best practices into motion. I wanna make certain that we have some level of uniformity, which I think will help our citizens comply. Balanced enforcement is going to be the greatest challenge for all of us. 
and I believe our citizens are going to be prepared to act responsibly. So I know that uh, we've been in contact with the county administrator, but I just want to start preparing for the point where we feel like we are comfortable and that it is safe enough to allow people to return to the beaches and other activity centers. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, uh, we continue to have hands go up. We have five speakers that are, are in the in the list right now. Our next speaker is Gwen Douse, D-O-U-S-E. Um, okay. And I would ask again if you're if you could keep your comments brief, especially if it's been talked about before. Yeah, I've cut down on my comments. Um, and I want to thank all of you for your very serious and careful assessment of everything that's going on to keep us safe. I live in a condominium on Clearwater Beach and reopening condominiums, while we all would love to be swimming and walking on beaches, does put us at a much higher risk of getting this dangerous virus, which we haven't talked about at the danger level, which is easily transferable and potentially deadly and for which unfortunately we don't have a vaccine yet. Why do we want to take this risk? And speaking from experience, I can say that condominium pools are close quartered venues and prior to the closing of them in March, it had been shown to encourage groups of people to be in close proximity, despite the strong guidelines that our condominium had placed. In addition, common areas around the pool are not continuously wiped down, it's just not practical which poses another health threat in this common area. These pools are generally located next to condominium buildings, which provides another opportunity for spread as people who have congregated are now entering the buildings. And because of the lack of testing, we don't know who or doesn't, who has the virus or who doesn't. There will be plenty of time for pool swims when this health crisis is under control. Unfortunately, now is not the time a few impatient voices should not preempt common sense. And again, I thank each and every one of you for all your help today. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Tiffany McNeil Beach. Uh, Ms. Beach, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, give us your name, spell your name, give us your address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Tiffany Beach. I live 11 Baymont Street on Clearwater Beach. Um, we have a huge pool deck, it's massive size. Um, our condominium was doing a great job policing things and limiting and social distancing. Um, it's, it would be really nice to be able to just walk out there and see the sunset, um, enjoy the beautiful rays of Florida. Um, we all wanna be safe, we all wanna be secure. And we all want the best for our future, um, so just, Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, we have three remaining speakers coming over the phone. Uh, they do not have their names listed. So we'll start with the last four digits, 5494. Uh, if you can go ahead and uh, give us your name, uh, address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. That looks like Mayor Hibbert's number. Oh, that was Hibbert, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, let me go ahead and uh, move on to the next one then. Uh, As I look at the calendar, there are two weeks out until hopefully the governor's order expires and we can go back to our safer at home. Uh, I mean, that's one scenario that I hope it goes down that path. And I, our staff can burn a lot of resources answering the same question over and over. As much as it's gonna be an imperfect implementation here, it's gonna be that way because the governor's order is imperfect. And so I'd much rather have our staff, you know, they've talked about this several times, they've looked at all those issues, talk about how we connect citizens and businesses with resources over this next two weeks, because folks are really hurting out there, and then really concentrate on that reopening and rebuilding program that hopefully kicks in, you know, next month and, and the CARES Act and all of that, those resources. So that's where I think we should focus uh, just as one commissioner uh, moving forward. I think our staff and, and our policy group has given a lot of thought to these issues. We're not going to get a perfect ordinance. And I think we just, just burn a lot of resources trying to get there that can be used better uh, elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. 
And I would agree. I'd rather see staff spending all their time on, you know, a relief program and uh, just keeping us safe for the moment. And uh, that's next item on the agenda. However, we need to um, extend our order. I'd move approval. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion from Commissioner Welch, second from Commissioner Seal. Please raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Okay, that is unanimous. Um, is there anything else we need to do with that, Barry? No, that's it. Um, uh, just the approval of the extension. Okay, thank you. Um, so next we'll move into um, directing staff to develop economic impact programs to businesses and individuals. Yes, commissioners, this is in direct response to the CARES um, Act and this would, uh, we've been working very hard at the staff level to determine uh, what type of stimulus dollars um, are going to be, are going to flow to us um, from the federal government that we can then uh, use to assist our residents and businesses. Um, obviously, when you develop a program like that, we're trying to you know, see the rules, um, try to get a sense of when the dollars would actually flow. But we also understand that time is of the essence, especially for families trying to pay their rent, trying to pay their utilities. And so we are asking um, a couple of things today. One is that you direct staff to, to um, create the program that would, one, assist individuals. This would be um, families uh, that, are, that have had a COVID qualifying event. The, depart, uh, the federal guidelines have yet to be published. They're going to be published supposedly on the 24th. But we want our program ready to go. So our program would be designed through an existing program that we have, which are, is our Adult Emergency Financial Assistance Program, with an expansion of the eligibility criteria, and then to provide direct payments as necessary, um, up to $4,000 per family uh, for one-time assistance for rent, for utilities, and qualifying things. Well, but we want to design the program, get it ready, um, and as soon as the federal guidelines, even if we're we're willing to even front the money as long as we know that money will come. Um, and so we can get that money in people's hands quicker. Um, so our, our request today is that we direct, we design the program for individuals. We design the program for businesses, which would include small, uh, small businesses negatively impacted, um, a rapid payment of up to $5,000 per small business. This would be defined by businesses having 25 or fewer employees, have a physical location in Lake County, um, and are designed around. In, that would be Pinellas County. In Pinellas County, sorry. <laughs> I, I won't say I'm new. I can't say that anymore. No, um, you can't. So, um, but it, for Pinellas County, but it, to, for it to be our small businesses right here. Um, and so we got to put some more criteria around this, but that's the intent of the program. We estimate 6,500 businesses we call, qualify under this program. Um, and then finally, that you authorize me to um, sign the uh, grant application, which is due tomorrow to the Department of Treasury. They didn't give you a whole lot of time, did they? Um, they they did not. Beggars, did you have your hand up? You're, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I just gotten a call from um, uh, one mayor um, and had a conversation with another um, just trying to get a feel for um, a, a, any type of thought process going on, uh, getting some of this money to the cities to let them administer it, or is that something that we're gonna solely uh, administer uh, for the entire county? Uh, just a question, as they're doing their planning for recovery, they're trying to figure out if any part of that looks like, um, was it 170 million that you identified? Up to, up to about 170 and that's part of what we have to yet get defined we also want to make sure that it, you know the dollars that have been identified don't, don't somehow get diverted to other places um and so trying to get definition on that is key um but i do want to get the application in i want us designed our local program we believe the assistance to businesses 
and uh, the individuals that we can manage. Um, we have a program in place to where we can process it quickly. If we try to have individual cities design 24 individual programs, we believe that delays getting assistance to our businesses and individuals. Um, I have had con some conversations with cities and I understand that concern. Um, there, we, we're also gonna look at the dollars to see if there's flow through dollars that would address assistance to like county government or to cities um, and the impact you know, that that has had. However, that's, um, we wanted to first move on the things that impact our small business and, um, and, and, and families first. Certainly wouldn't prohibit us from at least having, getting input from our cities um, on these issues. So yeah, I thank have you. A call to, I have a call today with our cities following this conversation at three o'clock. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Welch. Barry, did you say your estimate was up to 4,000 per family and 5,000 per small business? That is correct. What's your uh, target for implementation? Well, the implementation is immediately after, for the, for the um, individuals, uh, for the families, immediately after we, we get the federal guidelines on the 25th. Um, we believe it's gonna take us a little longer for the businesses under the program. There'll be an application process through our small business center. Um, and so, but we have to design these two programs. That's the reason we, we went through our existing adult emergency final assistance. It's a, it's a, it's a current program. We have, it's automated and we can process it quickly. Um, and that's, that's the beauty of the, of using a current vehicle, um, in order to be able to get assistance to people quickly. That's the reason I also mentioned, especially around that program, that once we see the federal guidelines, we, we understand clearly its use, uh, but I would recommend that we go ahead and begin that program even before we receive a check from the federal government, um, because we understand time is of the essence for families. Thank you, Barry, this is excellent. It's exactly what we need to be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just on the implementation part of it, uh, we, we go through assuming that we get the, the go ahead from the federal government that we're getting the money, you're working on designing a program, then it will come back to us to approve the final program? Yes. Okay. Yes, we have to, we will have to have um, final design eligibility criteria. We have to have to make find our legal counsel before Joel jumps in or will <laughs> informs us we have to have findings of fact that design the program ele elements. That way you design that these this program is out or this business is eligible, this business is not. And so we have to put the definitions to the program. Um, so we, we know the concept of what we want, um, but we need to um, finish the design and the details. And are we looking at those, the, um, the big thing I hear about from some of the other, I know some of the cities have started to implement programming mm -hmm. is the number of employees uh, per company and where that magic number is that that uh, it's the ones that are impacted without with, with allowing enough money to where it has a positive impact as well and that's something that we are we are looking at and you know we could have uh, we've even talked about kind of a phase one um, you know and, and possibly a phase two and that would be designed based upon the funding that we end up receiving um, when we're talking you know, five thousand dollars times you know times sixty five hundred uh, businesses. That's thirty two million dollars, um, and we're talking another you know similar amount with with families, and and so it depends on the the uh, amount of dollars that flows down and the criteria they put around how the use of those dollars. So until we so we we know the concept, um, but we don't have the rules yet. So until we have the detail, we can't really finish designing the program. Thank you. Let's hope they're quick with that. Uh, Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm sure that um, you're putting parameters around whether people are already receiving unemployment, um, including the federal unemployment extra, plus also anyone who's um, accessed the CARES Act for the Payment Protection Plan. We, we haven't finalized the, the individual details, so I, I, I don't know the answer to that directly, but um, you know, I think the idea is this is stimulus dollars, if, and those would be in the rules that would come out from the federal government about whether if you access something else, can you access these? And we don't have those yet. 
And then I'm sure that we'll be looking at industries that may have been affected um, disproportionately. And Absolutely. That's where I talked about that first phase. We would really want to look at our hospitality, tourism, and the businesses most impacted from uh, the coronavirus. So an individual that might be working for a large hotel, they could access it individually. The, they would have individual assistance if they're a Pinellas County resident. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, just one question on the, uh, you, it's called it's the stimulus bill. So as it relates to businesses, I know in uh, one particular case, uh, somebody's making an application and it's very, they're getting the money is what, they don't know whether they're going to get the money or not, but if they do get it, it's important that the, the, that there's an employee level maintenance. In other words, you, you get the money, you let go everybody, you don't have anybody. And those folks really aren't eligible for the stimulus money. Now, maybe another pot to offset some of those expenses. Are those the kind of things we're also waiting to hear on um, as we develop this program? That's correct. It would be it would be defining what those uses could be for. In other words, is it for your rent as a business or is it continue to uh, uh, make payroll? Um, and those are some of the details that, that we're looking for. We're certainly targeting the program and want to encourage it for businesses that remain and employ people and, and um, you know, contribute to our economy. But those are some of the details that we're, we're working out. The you know, my, my main concern was that we act quickly, um, you know, and and we have this in place to where when we can finalize those details, we can get it to you and we can get money in people's hands quickly. Um, and, and that's the reason we're asking you to, you know, advance this without, you know, having all of the uh, program details uh, completed. Great. I think it's awesome. Move approval. Uh, okay. Commissioner Peters, is that a second or a comment? Second. Okay. Madam Chair, we'll need uh, the opportunity for public comment on this one. Is it a vote? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. So at this, at this time, like to... yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask it. Any member of the public who wish to comment on this agenda item, please virtually raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone or by pressing the raise hand button on the Zoom application. And Madam Chair, there are no members of the public that wish to be acknowledged. Okay. Uh, any board members want to comment? Okay. If not, all in favor say uh, or raise your hand. Aye. <laughs> aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And thank you for working on that. Um, do we want to jump right into our agenda briefing or do we want to take a little break? I'd like to take a little break. Let's do that. How okay. long? 10 minutes. Thank you. Come back at uh, 1215, if that's OK. Wow. Uh, okay. so. I'll just mute everybody, Madam Chair.
we have our agenda review. Uh, let's see. We have uh, two public hearings. Mr. Burton, you want to talk about that? Yes, the first item uh, is a countywide map amendment from recreational open space to public semi public on two acres. Uh, this is a vacant parcel that is proposed to be a single story medical office building. Forward Pinellas voted uh, 10 to 2, Planners Advisory Committee 14 0 to recommend approval. And this is the one we talked about a few weeks ago. This is. They have worked with the um, residents uh, to resolve some landscaping and screening issues. Um, so hopefully yeah, both sides are satisfied. Okay. Um, the, sec the second item is a petition to vacate 1.1 feet of a 40 foot wide drainage easement. Uh, this will clear an accidental encroachment created by a newly built staircase. Uh, county staff have um, no objection to the vacation request. Anybody have any questions? Okay. And we have our consent agenda. Um, Three, four, and five are just reports. If you'd like, um, on item six, this is a declaring surplus um, and authorizing the uh, county sale surplus equipment uh, and vehicles. Uh, we have we will know uh, qualified nonprofit agencies are given advance notice of the uh, surplus rolling stock items. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Steele. Uh, yes, Barry, I just want to thank you. This was something you and I had discussed in trying to at least allow the not-for-profits to be able to buy this equipment at um, a better value rather than knowing that we can't donate to them. <clears throat> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Item seven and eight are reports. Um, item nine is an award of bid to American uh, Empire Builders. Uh, this is for a the West Wing and Crosswinds Drive uh, bridge replacement project and the amount of $4.4 million. Uh, there is a small business enterprise goal for this project of 10%. Three. Uh, item 10 is an award of bid to MTM contractors for the Sunset Point sidewalk project from Alt 19 to the Pinellas Trail. This is for $752,000. Item 11 is an award of bid to Ajax Paving um, Industries of Florida for asphalt overlay and patching services for fiscal years 2020 through 2023. Um, again, this is for various uh, projects throughout the county. Um, for a total of 2.998 million, and there is a, uh, a small enterprise goal of 10% uh, for this contract. Thank you. Um, item number 12 is a ranking of firms and agreement with engineering design technologies for engineering services pertaining to the North Water uh, Booster Station Variable Drive or Variable Frequency Drives Modification Project at the Ke uh, North Keller plant. Uh, this uh, this was the number one ranked firm, um, and the cost is $265,000. Any questions? Okay. Item 13 is change order number eight to a contract with American Facility Services for janitorial services at various county buildings. Uh, this would include additions uh, that are not were not in the previous contract of Public Works, Sheriff's Operation Warehouse, and additional buildings at the Lowman Exchange, adding a total of $116,000 annually to the contract amount. Okay. Item 14 is a Florida Department of Transportation Public Transportation Grant Agreement for the purchase of exit lane anti-pass back technology, um, obviously at the airport <laughs> for, um, this is a, a grant agreement for four hundred thousand, or total project cost of eight hundred and fifty thousand. Hmm. Um, item fifteen. Uh, is, wait oh, a minute, Mr. Long. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, Barry. I could I could I go back to item thirteen for just a moment, please, because 
this is a considerable amount of money. I realize it's over a fairly long period of time, but um, where 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 does this? I I guess it's for maintenance and repairs and stuff like that. Janitorial. But, So uh, let, let me let me provide some clarification. So you're you're right that the contract has increased a significant amount. And it's over you know multi years, um, but the biggest increase from the original contract amount was by adding the airport. So that was a previous oh. change order. This is change order number eight. This only adds one hundred sixteen thousand. Okay, but that but my bigger question is, how does this? It just leads me to wonder, in spite of everything else that's going on with the pandemic and and the coronavirus, if this has put a kink in our ongoing study or whatever that we were doing with regard to our facilities overall. Well, that's a, obviously that's a separate um, contract that we have. We are right. um, continuing with that. Uh, they're doing right now. They're doing. Um, um, information off-site gathering all of our facility information all and they're beginning to load all that obviously on-site inspections and that will have to occur at a later date okay that's really what i wanted to know if that was still ongoing all right thank you thank you thank you madam chair <clears throat> item 15 is a resolution approving the required five-year update uh, to the uh, local, uh, to the Pinellas County local mitigation strategy, also known as the All Hazards Mitigation Plan. Item 16 is change order number one to a contract with Granite Inliner for storm sewer cured in place piping services. Uh, this change order uh, increases the contract by 2.1 million dollars due to unanticipated piping, uh, relining work uh, that needed to occur on uh, uh, Keenan Road, uh, Belcher Road, and 113th Street North. Madam Chair? Yes, ma'am. Barry, could you give a little more clarity, please, on where on Keene, where on Belcher, and where on 113th Street this work is going to take place? and when are they going to be starting that? Because I would envision that that would be quite a disruption. And if, if I can, um, we, we don't have Megan on the line today. If I can, I'll make sure that we address that for you prior to Tuesday. On Tuesday, that would be great. Thank you very much. You bet. Item 17 is a sole source purchase agreement with ATOS. Autos, something like that, IT so, solutions and services as requested by BTS for voice over internet, um, internet protocol, telecommunications equipment and services. Uh, total estimated five year expenditure, a little over $4 million. Okay. Item 18 is the 2020 through 2024 local workforce services plan as submitted by WorkNet, Pinellas, i.e. Career Source, Pinellas. Under number 19 on your agenda, uh, this is a proposed settlement. This isn't an item which you are used to seeing come to you uh, together with a confidential memo. Uh, obviously this meeting format is not conducive to that. What I would ask is that uh, each of you take my phone call over the next couple days. Um, and I will call each of you to tell you about the facts of this specific case uh, and give you a briefing. Shouldn't take more than just a few minutes. And then you just have an appointment under item number 22. Okay. Do we have any new business items from the commission? Okay. All right. Anything at all about the agenda? Okay. Oh, Commissioner Eggers. You're muted, Commissioner Eggers. Um, I didn't know if we were going to talk about any of our board and committees or not, but I just really, all I wanted to say was that uh, uh, at Fort Pinellas, uh, we did not have any of our meetings in late um, March um, or 
um, in uh, our meeting this month, but uh, at the end of this month, our committees will start to meet, our subcommittees, our advisory subcommittees will meet virtually and we are planning to have a board meeting the first or the second, I think it's the second week, uh, 13th, I believe it is, um, in, uh, in May. I know that there's a governor's order issue that we may have to deal with. I'm not quite sure how that's gonna work out, but I, I really just wanted to uh, thank um, all the other MPOs in the area are, are conducting their meetings as well. I wanted to thank our board Pinella staff, our own communications group. I know there's some, some discussions this afternoon and also Jules office on the legal kind of um, concerns that they have with this, but uh, just kind of guiding us uh, the best that uh, we can. Um, also with Tampa Bay Water, we we're having a meeting on April 20th, which is next Monday. Uh, we are doing a virtual meeting. Uh, <clears throat> it is, we meet every other month. So this is our every other month meeting. And again, wanted to thank our Tampa Bay Water staff for all the work they have been doing. Uh, we will be doing a budget session at that at that meeting. Uh, essentially, the rates are going to continue to hold. It's probably about the tenth straight year that they have held. That's the wholesale rate that we pay, uh, that all the member governments pay. Continue to uh, work on water quality and uh, master water plan. There, that's the big, big uh, effort, big focus of our efforts. Um, there is a water consumption concern a little bit. I know the utility directors got together uh, this week, uh, or last week, excuse me, to talk about that. They seem to be focusing on um, the dry, the dry weather, the lack of rain, and a lot of the irrigation uh, that our that our residents are using on the water as the cause um, of that uh, consumption increase, and not so much related to any of the um, the. Uh, at home activities that we've been doing. So, but they're looking at that very closely to make sure that we're doing the right things at the right time as it regards to water consumption. And, and really that's all I had. Just wanted to let you know about those two groups um, and their meeting schedule. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Walsh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Eggers, will the um, Fort Pinellas meeting be using Zoom as well? Uh, yes, it is, uh -huh. and it's being it's going to be basically modeled right after our BOCC meetings and the different people that have played roles uh, like Brian. They'll have somebody else uh, in that in that role, but uh, not I'm sure not do the job that Brian has done. But um, but in any event, uh, we'll be have we'll be mirroring it kind of exactly after that. So okay, and for my PSTA colleagues, I think we're using a different technology, WebEx or something. Oh, are we? We have a practice session tomorrow, right? Yeah, I was just wondering why they're not using Zoom as well, but that's for a different day. I don't know, Tampa that would Bay. make it easier, wouldn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah Tampa Bay Water's using something even different. So yeah, I just like, yeah. can you not all use the same thing, but anyway. Yeah. Special Long? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a couple of things. First, I would like to share with you, uh, for Barry, this is especially important for Barbara with her the communication pieces that she's sending out all the time. But <clears throat> I got a neat little notice uh, from Washington uh, late yesterday that says, and for those of you who have your own uh, communication uh, vehicles, you might want to include this and I'm happy to send it out. But the Department of Treasury is beginning to send out electronic payments to individuals as part of the CARE Act. As a result, we've been alerted to fraudulent emails and phone calls individuals are receiving saying they are from Treasury or the banks asking for updated account information so they can deposit federal checks. These are scams and we wanted to alert you so you can alert your residents through your public service announcements and other media outlets. And that came to us uh, not only from our congressional office, but from um, Van Skoyak. And then secondly, I wanted to share that T. Barda has our regularly scheduled board meeting tomorrow. We are doing it through Zoom. Our committee meetings will start at 830 and go right on up until our board meeting starts. And again, as Commissioner Welch already indicated, PSTA's board meeting is next Wednesday. Thank you, everyone. That's the end of my report. Oh, one more thing. Thank you for giving me, for bringing this to my attention. Um, you all know that the 
John Maroney Foundation awarded some dollars for um, to shore up a mental health program for our first responders, fire and EMS and law enforcement people. And <clears throat> that contract has been let out to providers and it is now active and for people who need that service, there's a click on the John Maroney Foundation website that you can go to and get all the information that you need to apply for it. So that uh, there's a flyer that's going out to all the law enforcement communities and the EMS folks and firefighters today. So thank you very much. That's the end of my report. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I've been on, I think, four different uh, conferencing platforms in the last week. So. Uh, you try and learn a new one every day. I just wanted to mention, I sent you all an email uh, that has two or three news articles uh, kind of going over some of the really neat programs that Amory Winter and her team are doing at the Area Agency on Aging uh, in order to get uh, uh, contact, to get uh, supplies, and to get food to our seniors uh, during this time. So the articles are great, and, and she and her team are doing a really incredible stuff. So I wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, a couple things. One is I will send you an email update from Beth Houghton with Juvenile Welfare Board, and they are doing an awesome job in trying to meet the needs of the children and family, including emergency food assistance, um, uh, some capacity improvements at CASA, a children's mental health services um, for telehealth services for children for directions, by directions for living. Um, they gave $14,000 to stock the food pantry at Maddie Williams Neighborhood Center and um, <clears throat> 100000 for one-time allocation for bulk food purchases for our four main Pinellas food banks. So um, they're doing much more than that, but I wanted to highlight that because they um, you know, really are trying to address the emerging needs as they take place. Um, the other thing is... Um, Commissioner Long, for your calendar, um, T-BART has been moved to April 24th. It's not tomorrow. Oh, thank you. Okay. So, um, yeah, I came across canceled on my calendar. And so then, um, I, anyway, that's been rescheduled. And then finally, um, mm -hmm. our emergency um, operations phone calls executive policy group meeting each morning. Um, we get an um, update on many different things and including our ability to do uh, COVID-19 uh, testing. So um, I'd like that to be when you do your Facebook messages or Commissioner Gerard, when you're doing your messages, if we could include some updates on that for the public, I think that would be um, worthwhile. Thank you. Great. Commissioner Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I want to thank Barry and his staff for doing the Mental Health Forum. Um, I did watch it on Facebook Live, so that was really great. They had um, April Lott talking about things you can do for your mental health. I think it was wonderful. Several of the chambers are doing the same thing because they can reach maybe a different audience, so I'm proud of the work that they're doing there. Also, uh, Early Learning Coalition, they are um, working, they're providing financial assistance for first responders and healthcare workers for child care services for anyone um, birth to 13. Um, they've received 33 referrals for emergency care. Um, there is a scholarship for those uh, families. And just to be clear, that's, it's really for first responders, law enforcement, public health and healthcare workers um, that were defined in the governor's executive order. Um, they have 73% of all licensed child care centers and 17% of all family child care centers uh, homes are closed. Um, they are working really hard with those that remain open to uh, adhere to no more than 10 people in the CDC guidelines. However, the providers who remain open are struggling to secure supplies such as sanitizer, bleach, wipes, masks, et cetera. So if there are any resources that we can help them in providing those, um, 
necessary supplies to ensure that the children in child care um, are safe, that would be very appreciated. So those at home, if they could help provide that as well, would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Burke, sorry, Commissioner Eggers. I'm, you know, and I, I just was thinking and listening to everybody and thinking about the day today. And I don't know that I said it, and I just, I'm sure everybody, I know everybody else feels the same way, but I just really wanted to thank Barry, um, the sheriff, and the entire team for what I just think is just incredible work. I mean, we, have, it, it, this, there's no, like everybody says, there's no playbook for this. We have been just doing um, un incredible work as we try to figure things out on the run and things are continuing to get better every week. The communication has been awesome. Um, and now as we start to think, converse, and then later on start coming out of this thing, I know it's gonna even be a lot more uh, meticulous, careful work that has to be done by, by his staff. And uh, so I just wanted to say thank you, Barry, for all the energy that you and the entire team has brought over the last three or four weeks. It's just been, uh, it, the, the residents of this community can be proud. Thank you. Thank you. I would, I would just like to echo that the, it's not, it's our team. It's, it's Lourdes, it's um, uh, Daisy, it's Kathy Perkins and the entire emergency management team, but it's also all the departments that are assisting and all the partner agencies. There's 18 different teams and that's not just county employees working on those. Uh, just trying to, you know, get through this and make things better. So kudos to everybody on the team work, working to try to uh, respond to this uh, pandemic. All right. Keep washing your hands. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have anything else, Mr. Burton? That's all I have. Anybody else? We are adjourned. Thank you, Brian.